you hear me? Yeah, you can. Yeah. Um, members who have joined us online, uh, just bear with us. Some members of the committee, unfortunately, uh, went to the wrong location for the meeting. So we're just waiting for their arrival. Um, uh, and as soon as they've arrived, then we'll get things kicked off if that's okay.
Afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, apologies for the delay. Um, uh, we had a few members who got a little bit confused and went to the wrong places, but, but they're all here now, so that's the most important thing. Uh, uh, good afternoon. Welcome to uh, this month's uh, Planning Committee of Derry City and Strabane District Council. Uh, and can I just welcome uh, our elected members who joined us online, uh, those who are here in the chamber and uh, Derry Road in Strabane, uh, also, welcome to our own officer team who are located online and indeed here in the room. And of course, welcome to our visitors, um, applicants, uh, agents, etc. Um, you're all, uh, of course, welcome. Um, so we have a fair bit of business as usual to get through. Uh, so uh, without any further delay, we'll move to the items on the agenda. We'll take items number one and two together, uh, which is a notice and summons of meeting and the members' attendance and apologies. So I'll pass over to the head of planning, Maura Fox. Thank you, Chair. Members, you're hereby summoned to attend the monthly meeting of the Planning Committee, which will be hybrid socially distanced meeting to be conducted remotely via WebEx and also physically in the Council of Offices, Derry Road, Straban, on Wednesday, the 1st of February. Alderman Alan Breslin. Here, Maria. Thank you. <clears throat> Alderman Keith Kerrigan. Alderman Keith Kerrigan. No. Alderman Drew Thompson. Here, Mara. Thank you. Um, Councillor Jason Barr. Here, Mara. Thank you. Chamber. Councillor Raymond Barr. Online, Mara. Thank you. Councillor John Boyle. Here. In the Chamber. Councillor Angela Dobbins. As apologies. Councillor Paul Gallagher. In the Chamber. Councillor Christopher Jackson. In shot. In the Chamber. Councillor Dan Kelly. Apologies. Apologies. Councillor Patricia Logue. Apologies. Apologies. Councillor Kieran Maguire. In the chamber. Councillor Philip McKinney. Apologies. And Councillor Sean Mooney. Here. In the chamber. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Maura. Uh, again, welcome, everybody. Uh, so moving on to the next item in the agenda, which is the formality of the broadcasting statement. Uh, so uh, I'd like to remind everybody present at this meeting in the chamber here at Derry Road, Strapan, or in attendance remotely, that this meeting will be broadcast live to the internet and will be capable of repeated viewing. Uh, the broadcast may be terminated or suspended in accordance with our protocol. Due to your attendance at this meeting, you are consenting to being filmed and to the use and storage of those images for broadcasting or training purposes and for the purpose of keeping historical records and making those records available to the public. Members and approved speakers are reminded to only use your microphones and cameras and have them on while speaking. So don't only have your, your microphones and cameras on while you are speaking at this meeting and to use the chat facility to highlight or request to speak. A copy of the Council's privacy notice may be found on the Council website at uh, derrysterban.com. Moving swiftly along um, uh, to item number four, uh, declarations of members' interest in relation to um, the business of today's meetings. Uh, today's meeting. Um, I'll take those now. If anybody has a declaration, um, you'll have to verbalise that uh, for, for, for the record. Um, and if you should feel uh, through the course of the meeting that there is a declaration of interest, then, then I'll also welcome a declaration at that point. Don't see anyone declaring any interests. So we'll move forward to chairperson's business at item number five. Uh, and again, just a general housekeeping of how we're going to uh, conduct the business today. And so I'll pass it back over to Mara. Chair, thank you. In terms of late items, Chair, um, I want to draw members' attention firstly to um, a letter we received regarding item, uh, item nine and ten. And that's an email from um, Mr. Kennedy regarding the withdrawal of these cases from the system. So that's a withdrawal. Um, and we're we're hoping to receive a resubmission on a revised site so that you'll see that in your late item pack. So for today, nine and ten will be withdrawn from the agenda and a new application hopefully will be submitted. In regards to other late items, members, you'll see in terms of item one on the agenda, we have an email statement from um, uh, Christine Doherty, and that was received on the 10th of January. Um, in relation to item five and six, we have a letter from Daniel McCrossan, MLA, and that was dated the 26th of January. 
And thirdly, we have received only on the 31st of January a number of images which relate to the planning items 5, 8, um, 11, 12, 13 and 14. And that's it for late items, Chair. Chairs, uh, allow me to raise another issue with you members, just to, a reminder and an update. In regards to the LDP, um, I just want to let all members know that we will be reconvening um, a meeting for the LDP steering group. So members should see, um, of that particular group, should see an email in their diary, um, hopefully um, very shortly, um, recommending a date. Um, for us to reconvene, just to update um, those, that particular group yeah. of where we're at in terms of the LDP, but also just in terms of how we'll do business moving forward. So we're hoping to have a bit more information at the next meeting as well and papers for members. So it's just to, an awareness that we will be coming with dates in regards to that particular group. Thank you. Thanks, Maura. And just to um, advise Maura, um, when we were chatting about this earlier, it's likely it'll be sometime this month, but no fixed date on that at this point, members. So it's really just a matter of for those who are on the steering group, keep an, keep an eye out for that, um, uh, please. So moving along to um, item number six, matters arising from the open minutes of the planning committee meeting held on Wednesday the 11th of January. Any matters arising uh, from that meeting, members? Nobody in the chamber, nobody online. Uh, item seven, matters arising from the open minutes of the reconvened planning committee uh, on Thursday, the 12th of January. Any matters arising from that one? And finally, item number eight, matters arising from the open minutes of the special planning committee, which if you cast your mind back to the 14th of December, 2022, any matters arising from that? Thank you, members. Right. Well, before we move into um, the planning applications list and recommendations for decision, members, uh, as Maura has already mentioned, there are a number of late items that uh, came your way. Uh, and so, um, as is normal, we'll take five or ten minutes uh, for members to um, appraise themselves of those late items or maybe uh, refresh your memory, because obviously some of them came uh, a while back. So, five, or five minutes to Everybody happy with five for now? You need any more, of course, we can take more. Um, Councillor Jackson. But my apologies, members, yes, uh, probably was the right thing to do was to give you the running order, so let's do that. Okay, running order wise, <clears throat> we'll be taking the following items. Uh, number one, number three, number four, number five, number six, number seven, number eight, Number 11, number 12, number 13, number 14, and finally, number 2. Okay. So my apologies. Yeah, probably the right time to do that. So members, as I said, um, we'll take initially five minutes for you to uh, appraise yourselves of those late matters that came your way. If anybody needs any more time, let me know. Okay, so take five now. We'll come back at about 25 past two.
members, um, I'm content to move on with the business. If, uh, if you're all content and everybody's happy enough that they've read through those items, anybody need any extra time on it, let me know. Uh, or otherwise, we'll, uh, we'll proceed. Okay. Um, no members in the chamber indicating and um, members, just bear with me. One of the committees had to go to the restroom, so we'll just take a minute and allow that member to come back. Okay, uh, members, so we'll move on to um, the list of uh, applications and recommendations for decision in front of you here today. And we'll start with um, application uh, number one on your agenda, which is LA 11 2020 0651F. Um, and our officer presenting is Andre. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, item 1, LA 11 2020 0651F is for residential development of 10 number apartments within a single building and associated landscaping, open space, parking, access and associated works to include demolition of the existing house and outbuildings, which will take place prior to development at 6 Limavati Road. The application was deferred from the January Planning Committee meeting for a site visit to take place. Um, the site visit took place last Wednesday and was attended by planning officers and Councillor Boyle and Councillor Minnie. So the site is located at 6 Limavati Road. The site is within the development limits of the city as defined in the dairy area plan. There is a mix of single and two storey detached dwellings in the immediate area and adjacent to the site across from Danefield Road is a three and four storey apartment building known as Melvin Complex, which contains ground floor commercial units fronting onto Limavati Road. So this slide is an aerial view of the site. Uh, the site contains a two storey dwelling and outbuildings, which are currently vacant. The access to the site is from Danefield, which is accessed off Limavati Road. There are two mature copper beech trees located adjacent to the site on the footpath along Limavati Road and these trees are protected by a tree preservation order and lie outside the site boundary. So this is a photograph of the site taken from the Limavati Road at its junction with Deanfield and shows the existing vacant property on the site and the protected trees on the Limavati Road. And this is a photograph of the existing dwelling on the site and the adjacent single storey dwelling on Deanfield. This photograph is taken from Limavati Road, showing the extent or sorry, the existing property on the application site to the left and Melvin Court Apartments on the opposite side of the road. And a further photograph of the site and Melvin Court Apartments. And this photograph is taken from Deanfield, looking towards yeah. Limavati Road with Melbourne Court on the left and the application site to the right. And this photograph is taken from Deanfield and shows the existing dwelling at number 1B Deanfield and the vacant property at 6 Limavati Road, um, just in the background there. So the following consultees were consulted during the processing of the application. DFI Roads, EHD, SES, LOX Agency, NIEA, DFI Rivers and NI Water. Um, all consultees have no objection to the application and the responses are, responses are considered in detail in the planning report. So 52 objections were received during the processing of the application. Um, these are listed on the slide um, and are um, covered in detail in the planning report. So initially, when the application was first submitted to Council Planning, the proposal was for a four storey apartment building um, containing 20 apartments. Um, for this initial scheme, 40 objections were received. 
Uh, the proposal was then amended in September 21 to a three-storey building containing 15 apartments and four objections were received um, when the application was mm -hmm. further neighbour notified. In December 2021, a further revised proposal reducing the scheme to a two-storey building and 10 apartments was received and two letters of objection were received following notification. A further revised site plan and landscaping plan were received in May 2022 and one objection was received on this revision. Design changes were then made to the building in July and September 2022 and citing changes to the building to allow greater separation distance between the proposed development and the protected trees in Limavati Road. Neighbours and objectors were notified again and two further objections were received raising issues on road safety access, overlooking and privacy. In January this year, a further three objections have been received, including the late item objection in front of members today. Um, a detailed consideration of the objections is set out in members' report, along with the changes in design from when the application was originally submitted to that being presented to members today. And go ahead, yeah. So um, the relevant planning policies are the dairy area plan, the SPPS, PPS2, PPS3, PPS7, the addendum to PPS7 and PPS15. And again, these are detailed in the planning report. So with regards to this slide just shows the proposed site plan. Um, as explained, the proposal is for 10 apartments. Um, and that is in a mix of two one bed and eight two bed apartments in a two storey building um, located on the site at the junction of Danefield and Limavati Road. The principle of redevelopment, redeveloping the site to apartments is acceptable. During the processing of the application, the design was amended to be more in keeping with the existing two storey dwelling on the site in terms of its scale and massing. Mm -hmm. the separation distance between the proposed building and properties at Danefield and Hinton Park is approximately 26 metres and officers consider the proposed apartment building will not cause unacceptable loss of light or overshadowing in the urban context. Number one, Deanfield is located 30 metres from the proposed building. Um, the existing wall um, to the rear between the two, the existing application site and 1B Deanfield is being retained and a detailed landscaping scheme proposed for the development will also aid screening to this property. Parking is provided on the north and western boundaries and 15 car parking spaces are being provided, which is considered to be acceptable. The site is also in close proximity to public transport, with the nearest bus stop being located at Foyle Arena. Open space is not required for a development of this scale, however, a grassed area and landscaping is proposed in the site boundaries. The two trees in Limavati Road are protected by a tree preservation order, which has been considered by the developer and a wider and safer footpath for pedestrians is being provided um, along Limavati Road while still protecting the PPO trees. So the current design of the apartment building is two storey in height. The design has substantially changed and has been reduced in height, scale and massing from when it was originally submitted. The design changes throughout the processing of the application are set out in detail in members' reports. The design is now more comparative in terms of its scale and massing with the former building on the site, with similar details being incorporated into the overall design of the new building. Finishes proposed are black slate, um, a render finish to the walls and new BVC windows. The proposed building is 8.8 .8 metres in height, 6 metres to the eaves and measures 5.4 metres to the top of the first floor windows. Concerns have been raised um, regarding overlooking onto the property at 1B Deanfield, However, the separation distance of 30 metres, retention of the existing wall in the boundary <clears throat> and the additional planting of semi-mature trees at five to six metres in height will minimise any overlooking and the design is considered to be acceptable. So members, this slide just shows the side elevations um, which are onto Hinton Park and Deanfield. And this is just um, the proposed floor plan of the ground floor. Um, this slide shows the proposed um, streetscape with the proposed two-storey dwelling or building, sorry, apartment building in the centre. Um, and that's shown in the context of the adjacent property in Hinton Park and Melbourne Court um, apartment complex on the other side of Deanfield. 
So as um, discussed earlier, a detailed landscaping plan has been submitted with the application and the applicant proposes to plant new semi-standard trees on the northern and western boundaries, which will aid screening between the properties and the proposed apartments. Also, as previously advised and considered in detail in the report, um, there are two large copper beech trees on Limavati Road located on the existing footpath, and these are protected by a tree preservation order. Um, whilst they are outside the site, the existing wall, which you can see here on the slide, um, is to be removed to facilitate improved visibility space from Deanfield onto Limavati Road. The agent submitted reports detailing how the wall and the widening of the footpath at this location can be facilitated without impacting on the tree roots. This is deemed to be acceptable to officers and was considered internally by the tree officer who has no objection to the application. Um, this is a section um, just showing how the TPO trees will be protected with footpath improvements. Um, this work undertaken will allow for the wider footpath around the TPO trees, which will aid pedestrian safety on the footpath adjacent to Limavati Road. So in conclusion, um, members, the proposed development of 10 apartments um, officers feel complies with the Dairy Area Plan 2011 and relevant planning policy and a quality residential environment can be achieved. The detailed objections have been taken into account and the scheme has been reduced and height scale massing and design changes have been made during the process of the application to achieve an acceptable design and building on the site whilst taking into account the objections raised and therefore officer's recommendation is to approve. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Andre. Um, okay, members. So uh, online, um, online we have uh, a speaker. Um, so can I welcome uh, Gemma Jobling, uh, who is the agent for the applicant. Um, Gemma, thanks for joining us. You're very welcome. And again, also online joining us for uh, any questions that you, you might have. We have um, Simon Arienka and uh, Vincent Bradley. So again, Simon and Vincent, you're very welcome. Uh, again, on behalf of the applicant, uh, there was late, one late item there, members. That was the uh, correspondence from Christine Doherty, which you had the chance to read. So, uh, Gemma, without any further ado, I invite you to address the committee. The normal protocol is that you'll have five minutes initially to um, um, uh, speak to the committee in relation to your application. So, Gemma, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for the opportunity to address the committee today and to speak in support of this application to provide high quality gated apartments for those wishing to downsize in this much sought after part of the city. I appreciate you've got a lot to get through today, so I don't propose to take up all of the, the five minutes, but I would begin by asking the committee to endorse the recommendation of the case officer and the planning department to approve this application. Your officers and the statutory consultees have very carefully and rigorously assessed the proposal and recommended approval subject to conditions which we're more than happy to accept. We appreciate that there have been concerns, but the majority of those did relate to the 20, the original 20 unit uh, proposal submitted back in 2020. And of the 52 objections, only three um, really related to the reduced scheme. Uh, but please be assured members that we have proactively sought to engage with the local community. And while this is not a major application, we did carry out voluntary pre-application consultation. We went door to door and the applicant met directly with many of the neighbouring properties throughout the last few years and we wish to reiterate our willingness to continue to work with local residents during the construction and management of the development. As Andre has already set out, the application initially sought the three and a half storey building for 20 apartments on the basis that the design would offer a transition and step down from the four storey Melvin complex to the two storey houses in Hinton Park. Um, however, we fully acknowledge that there was overwhelming feedback initially and as such the applicant immediately sought to reduce the scheme, initially dropping one floor and then following further engagement it was ultimately reduced to the two storey uh, with the number of units halved to, to 10 apartments. Um, this scheme now has a significantly lower density than the apartments opposite at Melvin Complex and we believe this is entirely uh, in keeping with the character of this area and offers more housing choice along this key arterial route. We understand there, there were some uh, recent concerns about overlooking and again as Andre's already set out, um, great care has been taken to ensure that the privacy of the adjacent 
properties have been um, protected and in line with PPS 7 and creating places, the design incorporates adequate separation distances between the houses and the proposed apartment building. I'll not go through those as I appreciate Andre has already done so. And again, in terms of boundaries, we, we've been very cautious to, to sensitively deal with those in terms of the two metre stone wall with one Hinton Park and the planting of five to six metre semi-mature trees. Um, and also retaining elements of the old coach house wall. So consequently, we believe that the changes that we've made in, in response to concerns have resulted in a very sympathetic scheme. And finally, as, uh, as Andre has mentioned, we also believe we've um, made significant improvements to the public footpath there that sits to the front of the site along Lima Valley Road. The two TPO trees currently create pinch points on an uneven surface. So by removing the existing boundary wall and setting it back, we have um, been able to both improve the sight lines and create a level surface to allow uh, to make it possible for pram and wheelchair access along this footpath. So finally, members, in conclusion, uh, we believe this development is in keeping with the regional policy objectives and also that of your new emerging plan in terms of redeveloping these vacant plots to increase accessible housing and to take the pressure off the edge of city greenfield sites. So we would ask the committee um, to endorse the, the officer's recommendation and approve this scheme. But I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Thank you Gemma, um, and thanks for taking the time uh, to uh, speak to the committee. Uh, so um, we'll take any questions if anybody has any questions for Gemma, Simon or Vincent. Councillor Jackson. Well, um, thanks, Chair, and thanks to Gemma. I suppose it was already highlighted that this is a key arterial route and I know any, any applicant that is designing a scheme along the Lama Valley Road has to be mindful of the the overall character of the area and the and and I suppose the well the well voice concerns um of local residents and what what alarmed me at the start when I was reading through this was the original application and um I, I would concur with the officer's findings that um, that was completely unacceptable and what it showed was a complete disregard to the, the character of the area, to the the concerns that have been well well versed and, uh, and and I suppose the 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 constraints and the pressures that that road users are currently experiencing along the Lima Valley Road. So I understand that improvements have been made and changes have been made to the application, but I suppose by coming forward with a four-story application um, for 20 apartments on a contentious site, sort of, it doesn't, it doesn't fill me with confidence um, that that there's residential amenity and uh, the, the concerns of residents are something that the applicant is has got high on on their uh, on their mind at them. So, um, I, I if you don't mind, I don't know it's I don't know if you don't mind chair, but because it's not it's not relating to the application in front of us, but I, I do feel it's material because what was the thinking? Um, for coming forward with an application, four stories for 20 apartments on the Lima Valley Road at a junction where we already we already see um, high levels of congestion. Um, so I, I just, the, I know it's in, in relation to an earlier manifesting of this application, but I, I just wouldn't mind the thinking behind the applicant around the original application. Thanks, sir. Thank you, uh, Councillor Jackson. Um, obviously, that's that's a matter I'll, I'll afford um, Gemma to uh, explain. I suppose the question uh, that you've asked, uh, but you're conscious, and all members of the committee will be conscious, of course, that the application in front of us now is for ten apartments and not the original twenty. But Gemma, I'll pass it back to you. Yeah, ha happy to answer that, and completely understand where, where Councillor Jackson, where you're coming from. I suppose our starting point was the 
The SPPS and the Regional Development Strategy talks about creating compact urban forms and it talks about focusing higher density on arterial routes and sites that are close to public transport on urban sites. So that was really the starting point and because we had the four storey Hinton, or sorry, Melvin Court or Melvin Complex next door, um, we've seen that as a as a material planning consideration and that was really the starting point for the design. Although the proposal was um, over four storeys, it was designed to appear as a three and a half storey building. So we felt that would create a transition or a step down from the four storey at Melvin Court to three and a half storey in the apartments and then stepping down to two and a half storey. But as I said at the outset, look, as soon as the, the public feedback was coming through very loud and clear, um, we, we immediately sought to reduce the scheme. In terms of the roads and the access, that was something that we had assessed before the application had gone in. And I suppose the, the feedback we were getting is, yes, this is, this is of course a busy route, it's an arterial route, but it does have the capacity to take more and that's where it came from. But as I say, this is one that we'll, we'll hold our hands up on and uh, accept the, the community and the feedback from the local community. And as I say, although it wasn't major, we did carry out like a leaflet drop around the area before we launched the application to try and invite views and our client and um, the applicant also went door to door and, and met with many of the local residents and initially the feedback um, wasn't you know was quite positive they want they were welcomed the opportunity to see um, you know reinvestment in the housing stock with a lot of people talking about they were retiring and looking to downsize and were interested in some sort of high quality housing but that's smaller and would suit their needs so that was really the basis for it but as I say um, we, we we listened, we heard, and we certainly moved to make those changes. And I think um, I'll have to admit to say that I think the scheme that's before you now, members, for the two-storey 10 apartments, is it's a lovely scheme in the terms of the elevations and the treatment. We've been really careful to design it that it has all four elevations present the appearance of a frontage. So whether you're driving along Danefield or driving down Lima Valley Road or up Lima Valley Road, it will appear like the front of a, a house. So we, we feel it, it's actually resulted in a much better scheme. And I suppose lessons to be learned there are, there's a reason why community consultation is important and getting the feedback from the community who know what's in their area. And I think it, it's worked to the betterment of this scheme in the end. Hopefully that addresses your, your, your question or concerns, Councillor Jackson. Thanks. Aggie, Gemma and um... Councillor Jackson's indicated that uh, he's content to take your answer on that. Uh, any other members? Um, uh, Councillor Mooney. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I don't know who's maybe anybody can answer this one, but I was actually just uh, just maybe raising out of Councillor Jackson's previous um, question, but um, I'm just really, I wasn't too sure at the start of the GMS application that she said it was, um, I think maybe the, the market they were trying to capture would be for people who were downsizing because what I was reading from the, the late item this, uh, that we got this morning from one of the late objectors was, um, and I'm just raising this probably on behalf of the objector because the objector's not here, but it's likely to therefore encourage transient residents, but really obviously just that was um, being cognizant of the character of the area as Councillor Jackson has raised, and obviously there's apartments next door to the Melvin complex, but just maybe a bit more information as to what the market you're trying to... Um, Capture and the and the applications. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, um, Councillor Mooney. You got that, Gemma. So go ahead. Indeed, yeah. Happy to happy to answer that. One. Yeah, essentially, we're looking at the sort of downsize market and also professionals as close to, um, proximity to the city. Uh, our client, uh, the applicant Braidwater, have developed uh, a similar scheme, slightly larger scheme, but similar in Eglinton there for a private rental uh, scheme and it's proven to be really successful. It's won design awards and the feedback from the residents has been really, really positive there. It's high quality finishes um, and the long term uh, leases on it. You know, it's not certainly not intended or proposed to be short term. This is long term private um, rental accommodation with a high quality finish. That's why. And the reason why we include lifts and things internally in the site is to really aim it at that downsize retirement type market but obviously it's not limited to that so retirement slash professional cognizant of the proximity to the city centre there in terms of joy, jobs and things as well um, hopefully that answers thank you uh, 
Gemma, any other questions for Gemma members? No one in the chamber. Anybody online, any questions? Gemma, no further questions for you. Uh, stick with us, uh, of course. Uh, so, members, uh, any uh, questions now for our uh, officer team, Andre, etc., uh, Councillor Mooney? Just one, Chair. Um, and again, I raised it out of the late objection this morning, but I think the objector um, was creating the, the viability of parking spaces, but just maybe a bit more than that, Andre. I think there's 15 at the moment, but do you think, do you consider that's reasonable for the size of the complex and under the policy guidance? Thank you. Um, yes, through the chair. Um, thank you, Councillor Mooney. There is uh, 10 apartments and 15 car parking spaces. Um, now, there would be more if you were applying parking standards. There would be more required for 10 apartments, usually. Um, but we have to take into consideration the location. Um, it is on a main arterial route. It's within walking distance to local amenities. Um, there's a shop just next door at the front of Melvin, Com or Melvin Court. Um, there's St Columns Park nearby. Um, and close walking walkability to bus stops and the town centre and Ebrington. So um, we did feel that there was a compromise that 15 spaces were acceptable for the development for 10 apartments. Okay. Thank you, Andre. Any other questions for Andre or officers in general? Nobody? Okay. Thanks, members. All right, members, um, in front of you, obviously, the recommendation for this is for an approval. And again, I'll pass it back to yourselves and leave it with you for any proposals that you may have. So, um, how's everybody? Chair, um, I'm happy to propose that we um, are content to be appropriately proposed the officer's recommendation. Given the fact that um, I was at the site meeting last week and I would probably know the area because it's within my DA. Um, but we were at the site meeting and um, and I do take cognizance of the point raised by Councillor Jackson, but uh, I do feel that, you know, it seems that the, the, the developer, for whatever reasons, has listened to the concerns of local residents. Um, and now what we have is a final iteration of 10 apartments on a two-storey building, whereas the previous iteration was obviously for a lot more and would have been probably unacceptable given the character of the area and the location and and the uh, and, uh, topography, etc. Um, given the fact, too, that just directly off the street, there's a there's a, a, an apartment block that's in situ for probably over 40 years and it's well settled. And obviously, you know, flowing from one of the questions I asked, it seems to be that there's a certain market that it's contained that's, that is looking as well. but um, I do understand that there is, at the moment, there is, uh, I know there's a foot widening scheme on Lumber Valley Road in a minute, but obviously that'll stop at some time. Um, and being at the location and seeing, um, being outlined by officers, the, the, the car parking guidance and also the the way that um, the developer is um, managing the, the two trees that sit on, on Lumber Valley Road in the in the, in the and the pedestrian area, and also the fact that there was an issue with one of the neighbours and about overlooking and about how they're going to approach that. So, uh, in line with that, there, I think that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm okay to um, propose this here, Chair. So, happy to propose the, the officer's recommendations. Thank you. Okay, thanks, uh, Councillor Mooney. So, a proposal from Councillor Mooney for the approval. Do we have a seconder for that? Councillor Jackson, do you want to speak on this? Or? I'm moving on to the seconder now, unfortunately. Uh, uh, we have a seconder for uh, Councillor Paul Gallagher uh, as seconding the proposal uh, to approve the um, recommendation. So, members, uh, we'll put it over to uh, the vote now at this point. So, Mara, if you'd like to take us through the vote. Thank you, Chair. Uh, members, this proposal to accept officer's recommendation for item one. Alderman Alan Breslin. Aye. Thank you. Alderman Keith Kerrigan. Apologies. Alderman Drew Thompson. Or Mara. Thank you. Councillor Jason Barr. Thank you. Councillor Raymond Barr. For Mara. Uh, Councillor John Boyle. Or. Thank you. Councillor Angela Dobbins with apologies. 
Councillor Paul Gallagher. Or. Thank you. Councillor Christopher Jackson. Or. Thank you. Councillor Dan Kelly, with apologies. Councillor Patricia Logue, with apologies. Councillor Kieran Maguire. Thank you. Councillor Philip McKinney, with apologies. And Councillor Sean Mooney. Or. Thank you. Thank you, members. Um, <clears throat> obvious enough. Uh, Gemma, uh, thanks for attending. Um, and as you will have gathered, uh, that was the unanimous uh, decision to approve the application. So again, uh, thanks to Gemma, Simon and Vincent uh, for coming along this afternoon and uh, I wish you a good day. Um, so members, we'll move on to the next one, um, uh, the next uh, application number five on the agenda, which is uh, LA 11 2021 0760 F. Um, and uh, uh, obviously presenting that one is um, Laura. It's not Laura. Item three. Is it Laura? It's item three, John. Item three. That's her late item schedule. This is her Hang right on, number. bear with me, folks. I was reading the wrong piece of paper. That's item number three. So um, I'll reread that for you. That's LA 11 2022 0160F. Um, and the officer presenting item number three is Rosie. Rosie, my apologies, but I've got so many pieces of paper in front of me. I can't see. I'm picking the wrong ones up. Anyway, uh, members, I'll let Rosie present the report to you. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, members. Um, item three is LA 11 2022 0160F, and this is an application for the proposed direction of a high inertia synchronous compensator and building for the purposes of assisting stabilisation of the electricity grid, um, including the proposed direction of a high voltage building, a Sony air insulated switchgear control building, an all ancillary site and access works, including underground grid connection from within the site to the grid connection at the application site boundary. Um, this is on lands 100 metres east of Electra Road and approximately 210 metres southwest of Invista House Major mm -hmm. Works um, in Derry. The recommendation is to approve and the application is before uh, committee today as this is an application that falls into the category of major development. So just as a brief um, note about the purpose of a synchronous compensator, well, um, electricity has traditionally been generated and transmitted from fossil fuel power stations to homes and businesses. And this is a form of synchronous energy generation that produces the same amount of electricity all the time. It's a predictable source and they're easy, therefore easy to bring onto the grid. But in line with, our, with meeting our renewable energy targets, increasing amounts of renewable energy is coming onto the network, but renewable energy is a type of non-synchronous electricity generation in that it's not constant, so it doesn't produce the same power outputs all the time, and this results in fluctuations in energy supply and instability on the grid network. So whilst we're aiming to increase the amounts of uh, renewable energy coming onto the grid, this is happening alongside a move to um, a move away from fossil fuel power stations, all to reduce CO2 emissions and help meet our um, climate change obligations. Um, so because the power generated by renewables isn't constant and can fluctuate, the grid, grid system needs an alternative supplementary service to ensure continuity of sta stability and supply. And a synchronous compensator is a means of achieving this. So this slide just shows what um, the the buildings and infrastructure are likely to look at. So the synchronous compensator is housed inside um, this large building. Um, it's essentially a large motor that draws a small, it's a rotating motor that um, draws a small amount of electricity from the grid to maintain its rotational speed, but itself it doesn't generate any power. It actually acts as a damper on the system to slow down and smooth out any sudden changes in system frequency, which can occur with renewable energy sources. So it's also a carbon um, neutral form of technology, and it's estimated that one synchronous compensator could save um, 140,000 tonnes of carbon per annum and bring financial savings of approximately 6.7 million. So just to advise members that, um, as far as I'm aware anyway, that the, the, if you have any technical questions in respect of the operation of it, the applicant team is available um, to answer any questions after this presentation. 
So the site is located um, in Maydown Industrial Estate on a site that extends to 1.84 hectares. It's generally flat and gradient, and it's set back approximately 200 metres from Electra Road. So the site boundaries are defined by uh, scrub and vegetation, small trees, and access to the site is along a, an established access, which also serves um, the River Ridge Recycling Facility here opposite the site. So the, this slide here on the right just shows the wider industrial con um, context for the site, and you'll notice that um, Kilkira Power Station is um, opposite um, the application site. Um, this next slide just shows uh, the layout of uh, the buildings and infrastructure on the site. It shows where the compound will be with the transformers and the light, the electricity line, which will uh, go from the the compensator out, and then as as a, not which isn't part of this application, but there'll be another connection then across to uh, Kilkira Power Station and underground um, electricity supply. Um, neighbours, I just want our members just want to point out to you that the report states that there were no neighbours within ninety metres of the application site, but um, the River Ridge building is is within this ninety metres, and it and they were neighbour notified, but we haven't received any objections. Um, also, because this is a major application, it was subject to the public consultation exercise before submission of the application. And the Statement of Community Involvement report that was submitted with the application states that there were over 100 views of the website set up for the public participation, but that um, no comments were received. This slide just gives a summary of the consultation responses that were received. And um, you'll see there that the consultees had um, no objection or our recommended conditions then um, as well. Um, next slide just sets out a summary of the um, plan and policies which were considered, but these are detailed in the report before you. I'd also like to point out, members, that um, we are also under delegated authority considering another application for a synchronised compensator at uh, Kilkira Power Station, um, which um, hasn't um, been decided as yet. Um, the site then is located within Maydown Industrial Estate on land zoned for industrial use in the dairy area plan. So members, you'll note from the plan and report that there's a policy presumption in favour of the retention of lands which are zoned for industrial use. So the first thing we had to give consideration to was whether this development um, fell within the category of industrial development. Um, we consider that synchronous compensators, because they provide infrastructure in respect of electricity supply, aren't industrial in nature and are a sui generis use. So in, in respect of this type of or in sui generis or not industrial uses, the SPPS requires it to be clearly demonstrated how the special circumstances of the case outweigh the preferred option of retaining the land for economic development use. And similarly with PPS 4, PED 7, um, exceptions will be permitted where um, a number of criteria are met. And these are the policy requirements that we've given consideration to. So in respect of need, the applicant's statement sets out that Sony, who are the transmission system operator for Northern Ireland, um, has identified a need for additional power in this particular area within their transmission development plan. And the needs assessment carried out as part of that plan has indicated a strong need for a synchronous compensator within the Kilkira area to support and stabilise the grid. Um, in respect of consideration of alternative sites for the development, the locational need and proximity to Kilkira were important factors. And we've no um, reason or no inform information that would dispute the tra Sony's transmission development plan and the needs assessment and consider that the need for um, stable supply has been is demonstrated um, has demonstrated need. We've also considered visual impact. So this slide just shows a view on site looking out. You'll see there there's pylons in the site with overhead lines. Um, the application was accompanied with a landscape and visual impact assessment and 14 different viewpoints within that were considered. So I'm just going to look at the viewpoints there from Electra Road. Um, there's good screening given intervening vegetation between the road and the site. And from Maydown Road, it's some, you know, it's a similar circumstance. Um, the assessment that concludes that the location of the um, synchronous compensator is ideally suited to its purpose and that it's close to ele existing electrical infrastructure and surrounding industrial facilities along the ex along with existing vegetation effectively screen the proposal so visually it won't appear in Congress at this location. 
Um, given its uh, scale and form, the buildings are similar in size and design to other industri industrial buildings in the locality. We've given consideration to compatibility of this development with the other industrial uh, developments in the vicinity, especially in respect of noise and dust and emissions. So in respect of noise, um, there was a noise impact assessment with the application, which was assessed and, uh, by environmental health, and it has recommended conditions requiring a verification report to demonstrate that predicted noise levels are met and that to confirm that any acoustic mitigation measures uh, required are employed. Um, in respect of dust, there's a construction environmental management plan for the management of dust during construction. It's not anticipated there'll be any emissions during, you know, in respect of dust during the operational phase. And the development itself is zero carbon, so there's no emissions to air when it's operational. Um, the SPPS requires us to consider measures to mitigate and adapt to climate change. So, as I said earlier, this is a development which will contribute to the reduction in greenhouse uh, gas emissions by integrating increasing levels of renewable energy onto the network, and it'll reduce the reliance on fossil fuel power stations. Um, we considered natural heritage, and there's no impact on designated sites. The impact on badgers, birds, and bats have been considered and assessed by um, NIEA, and the, any impacts are considered likely to be low, and there's a landscaping scheme for around the boundaries of the site, which will compensate for planting as well. Um, there's potential for ground contamination at the site, and a contaminated land re report was, um, su was submitted, which demonstrated um, no risk to human health or the environment. Um, environmental Health and NIEA Regulation Unit are both satisfied with the conclusions and the report. Um, in respect of access, there's a haul route um, from foil port to the site for the delivery of the components of the compensator. Um, this has been assessed by DFI Roads and they're satisfied that the route can uh, accommodate the anticipated loads. And then once operational, the site is unattended except for routine maintenance twice a year. So access to the site is adequate for that purpose. Um, in terms of flood risk, uh, the, the site isn't in the or near any rivers, but um, in terms of surface water runoff, it's um, proposed to attenuate surface water runoff by an attenuation tank. And DFI Rivers have recommended a condition requiring the detailed design of a suitably sized attenuation tank before uh, works commence on site. Archaeology has been considered and an archaeological impact assessment considered by HED. This shows a low potential for uncovering buried archaeological remains and HED are satisfied with that um, conclusion. So in conclusion, members, the application is possessed against the policies detailed in the report before you. It's the professional opinion of officers having taken into consider the relevant planning policy, the report which accompanies the application, and all the consultee responses that the proposal is acceptable use at this uh, zoned industrial location, and that adequate measures will be put in place to mitigate any potential environmental impact. And approval is recommended subject to the conditions set out in the report. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Rosie. Um, very comprehensive report, members, I'm sure you'll agree. Um, so, members, we do have uh, um, a couple of speakers uh, who want to take the opportunity to uh, address the committee. So, can I welcome um, Tom Stokes uh, to the committee once again? Tom, you're very welcome. We also have Emma McElwain. Um, they, they are both the agents for the applicant. And, of course, we also have the applicant, Mr. Peter Hart, online. You're all very welcome. Um, uh, uh, for those of you who don't know the drill on this, um, uh, you have uh, five minutes to address the committee, but that's five minutes between you. So, uh, whomsoever it is that you've decided is going to speak first, I, uh, I invite you to address the committee now. Okay. So, go for it, please. Uh, my name is Emma McElwain of TSA Planning, and as you've noted, uh, Tom Stokes, TSA Planning Director, and Peter Hart is also on the call on behalf of the applicant. We do not propose to formally address the committee this afternoon um, and endorse the officer recommendation, but we are available if members do have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. So, members, as Emma indicated there, um, the um, she and Tom and Peter are available for any questions that you might have for them. Um, I have nobody in the chamber. I am looking to ask you a question, uh, and nobody has indicated online either that they want to ask you a question. So, 
um, stick with it, stick with us. I'm sure you want to anyway. Um, and uh, can I now also welcome uh, Councillor Kerrigan um, uh, to the meeting. Um, so, members, uh, any questions for our officer team in relation to this? No questions for the officer team. So, members, as you're aware, you have a recommendation for approval. Uh, I'll pass it back to yourselves for any <clears throat> any proposals. Councillor Mooney. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you to Rosemary for that very comprehensive um, outline on the in the application before us, um, I um, have no questions, and I've read the, the document and I've listened to Rosemary, uh, and I've noted that uh, there was no um, there was no objectors, and obviously this is a, a needed facility for additional power in the area. This synchronous compensator, as it's called, and obviously there seems to be um, green benefits as well to this. So, on that basis, Chair, I'm content to propose the application. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. I think I heard Alderman Breslin seconding that proposal. That's right. Uh, thank you, Alderman Breslin. So we have a propo proposal from uh, Councillor Mooney, uh, seconded by Alderman Breslin, uh, for an approval. Members, so again, um, without further ado, I'll pass it over to Moira and we'll put it through the vote. Thank you, Chair. Members, this is item three, and we have a proposal to accept officer's recommendation. Alderman Alan Breslin. Aye. Okay. Alderman Keith Kerrigan. Was late. Alderman Drew Thompson. For Mara. Okay. Councillor Jason Barr. For. Thank you. Councillor Raymond Barr. For Mara. Thank you. Councillor John Boyle. For. Thank you. Councillor Angela Dobbins. His apologies. Councillor Paul Gallagher. For. Thank you. Councillor Christopher Jackson. Abstain. Okay, thank you. Councillor Dan Kelly, as apologies. And Councillor Patricia Logue, as apologies. Councillor Keir Maguire. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Philip McKinney, as apologies. And Councillor Sean Minnie. Four. Okay. Six, seven, eight, eight, four, and one abstention. Um, okay, uh, members, as you've heard, um, we have eight, four, one abstention. Um, uh, so again, uh, thank you to Emma, thank you to Tom, uh, and thank you to Peter. Um, I'm sure you're happy enough to see that being approved by the committee. And again, thanks for joining us. And we'll move on with the rest of today's business. So, uh, members, next item on our list is item number four, which is LA 11 2021 0648F. Uh, uh, and again, um, the recommendation there is for approval of her presenting as. Uh, Suzanne. Thanks, Chair. Um, good afternoon, members. So this application, LA 11 2021 is for the erection of a circular precast concrete store with gas tight cover to provide additional storage for the proposed anaerobic digestate prior to being land spread. And the recommendation is to approve. And the application is front of you today because of the number more than five individual objections have been received. So this slide on your packs just shows the site um, and the satellite image of the site. So the site is part of an existing anaerobic digest date digester mm -hmm. facility that's um, approved um, quite some time ago. Uh, and the proposal is, is for the just a, an additional uh, cylind cylindrical uh, digestate tank adjacent to the road. This is a site entrance. Uh, the tank will be just in front of, of the adjacent building that you can see in front of you. Again, just to date, this is the block plan that was submitted showing the location of the site. Um, and you can see there just the elevation of the tank and the cover. It's a bit faint in your packs, but um, that's the, the scale in terms of the ground level. Uh, some views of the site on the left, members, of the, of just the of the actual um, farm or the grippings, and again, just a, a view from um, 
sort of a, a cross area just to give you um, an idea of the scale of the site um, and the tank will be located just to the immediately to the right of, of the large shed there. So, as you'll see from the packs, we've had actually 221 um, objections that have been received um, and those issues range, you know, there's odour and pollution issues within the area, concerns, um, concerns about the proximity to local primary school, impact on physical and mental health due to odours, apologies for the spell mistakes there, traffic impacts, queries regarding the AQIA um, that was submitted, um, concerns around river and ground pollution, concerns that this is another anaerobic digester, um, concerns about the meth methane and the combustible, um, concerns the cumulative impact of odours, impact on house, pre house prices and queries and how the initial ID got permission. So we have addressed those and responded to those in your report. Uh, what's, what are valid material planning considerations and what are not? Um, Obviously, the principle of the AD has been established back in 2014. Um, and again, there was a further permission in 2018 in terms of off-farm um, uh, feedstock being received. So in terms of the policy framework, it's listed It's it listed in your packs and I'll have it on the screen again for you, the main policies in front of you. Um, looking at the consultation responses, um, environmental health, um, we have Paul McSwiggan on the call today if anybody has any questions. Uh, odour and noise were considered. There was a AQIA or quality impact assessment submitted. This is a sealed tank to store digestate um, and there's no issue here in terms of you know, increasing the production, increasing the feedstock. This is this is literally another seal tank to or seal tank to store the digestate. Um, ADs are most odorous at the storage and input stages, as environmental health have advised. The only issue or the condition they have proposed is for an odor management plan, which would be standard condition. Mm. Um, shared environmental services had, you know, given the fact that there's no discharges into the air any water course because it's a seal tank. Um, they have no concerns. NIA, um, a number of departments were consulted in NIA, um, standing advice, um, the industrial pollution radiochemical inspectorate were consulted. They've considered the, the consent or the, or the content and they're content with it, sorry. Um, and then in terms of waste ma regulation unit, a, a new waste management authorization would be required, but those are statutory controls outside of the planning process. DFI roads are content. There's no intensification of the access. Um, so the fundamental issues in terms of planning consideration are the principle of development that's, that's long established at the site. The visual impact of an additional building is considered under PPS 18, policy RE1, and also CTY 13 and 14. Um, officers consider that, you know, these, these are large buildings, but there's already a, a very large group in there on the side of the road. Um, and this further building will integrate in there. Um, PPS 2, nature conservation, we have uh, considered the, the impacts on natural environment um, and there's no adverse effects that we can or we are aware of that are potential in terms of amenity. There will be, you know, the odour impacts from this proposal will will be very, very negligible. Um, the objections do relate clearly to the ongoing existing operations. Um, I know I've discuss this with environmental health um, just in terms of confirming the number, you know, how many complaints have we had over the years um, and Paul has advised I think there was four complaints in 2021 um, one complaint in 2019 and two complaints in 2018 that are, that are actually registered on, on our system um, that's not taken away from the fact that obviously, you know, people have put forward their concerns but from this proposal uh, this is an additional seal tank um, and the purpose of the seal and all is to ensure that there's there's no um, odours. ADs themselves, you know, the digestive will be less odorous, a lot less odorous, I think maybe 80% less odorous than what the feedstock going into the, the plant would be. Um, and it's not classified as waste. It's it's digested. It's not classified as waste. In terms of PPS three, again, uh, there's no intensification uh, and no increase in the inputs and in production. Uh, the tank is really to provide um, 
further storage, longer storage um, for the applicant or for the business. So members approval is recommended as as per um, the conclusion and the conditions are set out in, in section 12 of your report. So happy to take any questions. Okay, we'll take the questions for Suzanne later on. Um, thanks, Suzanne. Thanks for uh, the uh, presentation, members. As Suzanne mentioned as well, we do have Paul McSwigan from uh, our own Environmental Health Department online for questions later on as well. However, before we get to that, uh, we also have, and can I welcome, uh, Mr. William Moore, who's uh, the agent on behalf of the applicant. Uh, Mr. Moore, you're very welcome, William. Thanks for joining us. Um, uh, I'm sure you're well aware you've got uh, five minutes to address the committee initially. Uh, and then we'll uh, put their questions, if they have any, to you. So, uh, William, whenever you're uh, ready to go, uh, we'll uh, we'll hear from you. Well, I just want to want to reiterate. I suppose that the representations were actually not in relation to this existing proposal, um, which I think has already been well enough covered in this discussion. So, I don't really wish to make any formal representation to the commander here, but I'm here if they've got any questions or queries that they want to ask me in relation to it. Okay, thank you, Mr. Moore. So, uh, members, as you've heard, uh, Mr. Moore is available for any questions that you might have. If anybody has any, um, I'll take them now. Councillor Gallagher. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just a question around uh, the storage and how long is the storage envisaged for, you know, like a full tank, for example, and how long a period is there ex an expectation that it would remain a full tank, you know. Well, and, uh, well, so that's that the level of the tank will, will vary over the course of the year. But the main issue for this is during the close period, whenever you can't spread from sort of mid October until the end of January. I mean, today is the first day that people can actually land spread again on land, and as predicted, the rain won't stop and it'll probably rain now for about three or four weeks. So the whole in intention behind this is that they can actually just store the same amount of material, but for a longer period, whenever it's wet and ground conditions don't allow it to be applied to the land. Can I come back on again, Councillor Gallagher? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Just, you know, a, a question would be, that, see the longer it's stored, is mm -hmm. there a higher risk of leakage? No, not none whatsoever. I mean, all, all these tanks are approved by the Environment Agency for the job that they're doing. They're SAFO compliant, um, so there's no issue from that. I mean, the existing tanks have been on the site since 2015. They're precast concrete tanks. They're just, I think their design life is about 60 years. So in terms of emissions, and then there's actually a gas tight seal on top as well to prevent any odor emissions from what is, uh, so there will be no odor emissions or any other leakage. That's all contained within our waste management license as well, that we actually, you know, check for that and adhere to it. Okay, thank you, William. Any other members, any questions for Mr. Moore? Okay, William, nobody has yet indicated to me that they have any further questions, so thanks for uh, coming along. Um, uh, obviously, you'll be wanting to stick with us, and you're very welcome, of course. Uh, members, any questions uh, for the officers, um, uh, specifically Suzanne? Again, no questions. Uh, Paul McSwigan um, is also there if anybody has any questions for Paul. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay, go ahead. Come on at the well, last minute. Go ahead, <laughs> Councillor Gallagher. Thank you for the answers. Again, it's just relating to if, if, if this gets through, uh, will, will there be like monitoring to ensure that there's no leaks around orders and all the rest? Uh, that that's for uh, Paul McSwigan, Councillor Gallagher. Yeah. Sorry, councillors. There just um, problem with my buttons there. Um, no. Um, the site currently operates under a waste management license, and there are daily checks that are carried out on behalf, I suppose, in, in relation to the. Uh, Waste management license conditions. Our role in relation to um, complaints would be to investigate complaints from the members of the public and liaise with the, the regulator who controls the emissions from the site, which is in this case the NIA. But I don't know if Mr. Moore wants to tell Councillor Gallagher about the checks that they currently do on the 
on the site, um, but certainly something that we have witnessed when we have um, responded to complaints in the past. That's okay. Thank you, uh, Paul. Um, so members, bearing all of that in mind, bearing the report that you've heard, um, uh, clearly there's a recommendation in front of you here for uh, an approval. So again, I'd pass it back to yourselves. I'll take any proposals at this point. I propose that we accept the officer's recommendation. Thank you, Alderman Breslin. So we have a proposal from Alderman Breslin. Do we have a seconder for that proposal? I can second it, uh, uh, Chair Alderman Kerrigan. Thank you, Alderman Kerrigan. So proposed by, by Alderman Breslin and seconded by Alderman Kerrigan members. And without further ado, I'll ask Mara to take us through the vote. Thank you, Chair. So, members, this is item four, and the proposal is to accept the officer's recommendation. Alderman Alan Breslin. For. Okay. Alderman Keith Kerrigan. For Mara. Okay. Alderman Drew Thompson. For Mara. Thanks. Councillor Jason Barr. Thank you. Councillor Raymond Barr. For Mara. Thank you. Councillor John Boyle. For. Thanks. Councillor Angela, Angela Dobbins. That's apologies. <clears throat> Councillor Paul Gallagher. I'll abstain. Okay, thank you. Councillor Christopher Jackson. Thank you. Councillor Dan Kelly, as apologies. And Councillor Patricia Logue, as also apologies. Councillor Kieran Maguire. Four. Thank you. Councillor Philip McKinney, as apologies. And Councillor Sean Mooney. Four. Thank you. Nine four and one abstention. Nine four one abstention. Thank you, Boyle. Um, thank you, Senator. That and maybe I'll just confirm it. That was nine four with one abstention. So uh, again, can I just uh, thank William um, Moore for uh, uh, joining us here uh, this afternoon, and also Paul McSwigan uh, for joining us in relation to that application. Suzanne, thank you very much. Uh, and so, members, we move on now to the next item for your uh, our consideration, um, which is. Item number five on the agenda for decision, which is LA 11 2021 0760F. Um, an officer representing that, and that's up for refusal. And the officer presenting that is Laura. Good afternoon, members. Um, application LA 11 2021 0760F is for the retention of the existing unfilled land and boundary fence for the use of HEGV parking area and associated site works, including the removal of existing curbs within the site and alterations to the existing car park, um, including the layout and signage. And this is located at 19 Leopard Road, Straban, and the recommendation is to refuse. Um, so this slide shows the site location um, and an aerial image um, overview of the site. Um, so the site's located um, in the countryside is defined by the Strabane area plan. It's located along Lefford Road um, and between um, Lefford and Strabane. Um, so the application site is an operational um, retail um, commercial premises um, known as Dawn's Filling Station. Um, and the area specific to this application where the, the works are to be located are in the eastern section of the site along the eastern site boundary. Um, so these slides just show some images of the site, um, specifically where the land has been unfilled um, and the boundary fence has been erected. And then this is some views towards um, the application site um, and Dawn's. Um, the one there at the top of the screen is um, looking from the Strabane direction towards the site um, and that the lower end of the screen is from the Lufford um, towards the site. So this slide's just outlining the policy context under which we assess this plan and application. And then um, we have the consultation responses. Um, so environmental health didn't have any objections um, with regards to human health or noise um, and they considered um, information submitted um, in that respect. Um, there was 
two archaeological monuments um, located within proximity to the site, but historic monuments had no objections. Um, in terms of roads, um, DFI roads have no objections regarding intensification with regards to this application. Um, and they note that the site layout plan doesn't reflect the current layout um, or the works required to provide the parking spaces. Um, so they've recommended that if, it's, if this application be approved, amended plans are required, and if refused, they have stated that alternative parking for HDVs should be provided elsewhere within the site. Um, DFI Rivers have advised that the site lies within the 1 and 100 undefended fluvial floodplain, um, and that this development is not permitted unless it meets one of the exceptions of policy FLD1. Um, they've cons considered the FRA um, and stated that the flood extents are not increased, but the levels within the existing flood extent are increased um, to the east of the application site. Um, SAS have carried out a HRA on behalf of Council and have no objections, and NIA and NED have no objections and have provided advice. So in terms of establishing um, the principle of this proposal, um, it's considered firstly under PPS 21, which directs you to the relevant plan and policy statements. Um, firstly, we're considering policy FLD1. So this states that um, as a site lies within the 100, 100 fluvial floodplain, um, development will not be permitted unless it can demonstrate that it's a constitution or constitutes an exception to the policy or that it's of overriding regional importance. Um, so officers have considered the information submitted with the application. We don't um, consider that it falls in the, any of the exceptions and nor that it is of overriding regional importance. So therefore, in principle, it isn't acceptable under policy FLD1. Um, in terms of policy WM4 PPS 11, which refers across the policy WM1 of the same PPS, um, we can't rule out that there's an unacceptable adverse impact um, that can't be pre prevented or appropriately controlled by mitigating measures because of the, the flood risk which is posed. Um, so whilst we don't consider that the proposal is acceptable in principle under um, PPS 15 or PPS 11, um, we've considered it under the OR relevant uh, planning criteria. Um, so policy WM4 of PPS 11, um, as outlined in the report, we stated that it fails to meet three of the, the five criteria that are necessary to meet in that, um, in that policy. Um, so there hasn't been um, enough evidence provided to demonstrate um, that the proposal um, meets a local need. Um, and whilst it's assumed that the minimum fill has been used to provide a level area to increase the parking, it remains that the fill is unauthorised and contrary then, therefore, to policy FLD1. Um, so there are no works proposed to restore the site um, to its pre previous agricultural use, and no, so therefore there are no um, proposed works to, pro to enhance biodiversity. So therefore, we consider that the proposal doesn't comply with WM4. Um, in terms of PPS 21, integration, um, design and rural character are also assessed under CT by 13 and 14. And as detailed in the report, we don't have any issues um, in that respect. Um, in terms of amenity and human health, um, we don't have any concerns, um, which has been clarified also by environmental health. Um, NIEA and SES have assessed the proposal in terms of natural heritage, um, and there are no concerns. Um, and then in terms of PPS3, whilst it's considered that there's no intensification under the protected route, the layout um, and parking hasn't been demonstrated adequately in accordance with PP policy AM2 of PPS3. Um, we have had um, some representations with regards to this proposal. Um, there's been four letters of support. One has been um, submitted as a lead item. Um, I've just summarised the key points. They're also um, outlined in the planning report and considered in the planning report. Um, so overall, um, to summarise, um, in principle, um, this proposal is not considered acceptable. The site's located within the floodplain. It's contrary, therefore, to policy FLD1 of PPS 15. The proposed or the proposal increases flood levels, which is also contrary to policy FLD1, policy WM4 and WM1 of PPS11. 
the, the parking layout conflicts with the operational layout within the site, which is contrary to policy AMP2 of PPS3. Um, and also just to note, um, it's outlined in detail in the planning report. Um, this application was previously before planning um, and refused um, for similar reasons. Um, in 2014, it was also dismissed um, at appeal. Um, and at that time, the commissioner um, considered that it wasn't of overriding regional importance and it did not meet one of the exceptions of policy FLD1. Therefore, refusal um, is recommended. Um, so just to summarise, um, refusal is recommended for the reasons that are outlined in the planning report. Thank you. Thanks, um, Laura. OK, members, um, we have a few speakers on this one. Um, so can I welcome in the first instance, uh, Mr. Brian Kelly, uh, who is the agent for the applicant, uh, Honorable Hara, engineer. Uh, we also have um, online uh, who will be joining us after I afford those gentlemen the opportunity to address you. We also have joining us, uh, and can I welcome uh, um, Daniel McCrossan, um, who's no stranger, I'm sure to all of you, um, uh, MLA, and also uh, uh, further uh, speaker, um, who I know is absolutely no stranger to all of you, and that's Councillor Michaela Boyd. So, um, what we'll do here, and for the benefit of those who have joined us, is we'll hear from Brian and Connor first. Um, the protocol uh, allows for that to happen, and the protocol also um, will be Daniel number two and Michaela number three. I'm sure neither Daniel or Michaela would argue which one of them go first, but that's what the protocol allows us to do. So, um, without further ado, uh, Brian and Connor, thanks for coming. Uh, you've got five minutes between you initially to address the committee, um, and then I'll open it up to the committee to uh, address any questions that they might have for you. So, um, whichever one of you wants to speak first, um, take your time and, and go whenever you're ready. Thanks, Chair. Just checking you hear me okay? Loud and clear. Good man. Thank you. Good afternoon, members. Um, thanks very much for the opportunity to speak. Uh, sitting beside me is Gabriel Dolan, uh, the client, just to who that gentleman is. Um, this proposal is designed to bring much needed traffic management and operational safety benefits for the, the Dolan business complex. This is to sustain the 67 full time and part time jobs provided on the site, and it is essential to the long term success of the business. The need for this development is supported through letters received from uh, political representatives, and there is no third party objection to the proposals. Most importantly, DFI Roads has recommended that if this planning application is refused, that an alternative location should be identified within the site to prevent an adverse impact on road safety and traffic progression. There is no alternative location within the site for this facility. This is the only, only location for it. It's the most, most uh, key point in this, in this whole discussion. A few observations in relation to the refusal reasons. In relation to policy FLD1, McCoy Consultant Engineer was appointed to evaluate the impact of retaining the infilled material within the floodplain. Their findings are that the proposal does not affect the flood extent outside the site. There is no change to predicted water levels in the channels of the rivers Mourn and Boyle. There is a very localised effect where flood levels are increased by 15 millimetres on the site and up to 11 millimetres on land adjacent to the site. On lands outside the site, when an increase in flood level is predicted, it will be, you know, depths greater than 0.6 metres, and that's regardless of, of, of this development uh, of the infilled land. Infilling of the land took place about 20 years ago, and I suppose it was in response of a, of a need to safely park vehicles on the site. It is accepted that Mr Dolan was poorly advised on the matter by persons who should have known better at the time, and the planning process should have resolved this matter for him a long time ago. Policy FLD 1 Part D identifies an exception with development for agricultural use, transport and utilities infrastructure. My experience, and with a similar set of circumstances that I have advised with, the Planning Commission has been approved for car parking in a floodplain. A key consideration in those circumstances was that vehicles can be easily moved, and provided there is no significant change in flood levels elsewhere. In relation to refusal reason two, that the proposal is contrary to policy WM4 and WM1 of PPS 11. There are criteria established for demonstrating that you can deposit on land uh, to improve it. And there are four criteria. The first is that not to result in any unacceptable adverse environmental impact. Family risk assessment and a generic quantitative risk assessment have both been prepared by RSK engineers. The report concluded that the site does not pose an unacceptable risk to human health. 
The site does not pose an unacceptable risk to controlled water receptors. The site does not pose an unacceptable risk to human health receptors or guards to brown gas. Secondly, that there is a local need for the development and is demonstrated as the best environmental option. These works will provide a much needed truck park and layover that are essential to, you know, to improve operations and safety at the complex. Also, the site's been in full for a considerable period of time. Um, and you know, the material being there, that, that's the best environmental solution. If you were to remove that material, clearly that will give rise to environmental consequences with emissions from dust, noise, vibration, carbon footprint, and reduction in landfill capacity. Thirdly, that only the material limited or the only the minimum uh, quantum of material has been deposited on the site, and that's the case. It's just brought up to the levels of the wider complex, and there hasn't been any other material deposited on the site since. And then, fourthly, any measures around restoration, and Laura mentioned that um, you know that this material has been retained in situ. It's not posing a health risk, and that's been confirmed by environmental health themselves. Um, and SES Environmental Services and taken a, a habitat regulation assessment accepted that no further assessment is required. In relation to refusal reason three, I, I'm just confused on this point. And I suppose um, in the case officer's report, page 15, top paragraph, last line states, and I'm quoting here, there are no issues with regards to parking. And as such, the proposal is considered to comply with policy AMP2 of PPS3. That being the case, I don't understand why this is a refusal reason. So a great respect for the request that that refusal reason is withdrawn. If it's not, I'd be happy to explain further. And the final point to make is just in relation to planning history, because it was mentioned there, there was a previous application. That was for a different proposal. It was just for car parking. This is altogether different. This is about improving safety on the site, removing the conflict between HGVs and visitors to the site. Um, and it came as a consequence of the assessment by, by RPS engineers. So it is very different and not to just assume that we've refused it before, so we should again. Um, Chair, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. And if there's any questions, myself and Connor, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you uh, very much, Brian. Um, okay, I'm getting a bit of feedback. Or okay. Okay, members. Um, uh, so, um, has anybody got any questions that they would like to address to Brian and Connor at this point? Go ahead, uh, Councillor McGuire. Yeah, if we could just uh, recap on the, the flood engineers report and uh, and the stuff on WM one and four again, just. Please. You get that all right, Brian, if you want to recap on that for the benefit of the committee? I did. That, that's no problem. And I suppose what I was explaining was that there are except there is an exception there for uh, transport infrastructure utilities within the floodplain. And, and I have experience of in a very recent case, in fact, where car parking was uh, permitted within the floodplain um and, and it simply was because you know you can move cars you know and um and, and in any situation where there is a risk um and on this site and i know gabriel here beside me um you know th this site doesn't flood um and um and that's that's just that's just the fact of the matter um gabriel's been on that site now for this is their 30th year in business um so he, he knows what the conditions of the area are um and so that's in terms of the flood policy um you know, there is there is precedent for for car parking within a floodplain and um in terms of the material then itself um it's inert waste you know this is um this is you know builder rubble um type material um it has been assessed say uh, preliminary risk assessment generic quantity risk assessment it's clean and that's why there's no concern about pollution entering the foil uh, which is obviously a protected european site um, that's why there's no concern about uh, ground gas and so forth. Um, the best thing you can do is to leave this material where it is. Uh, if, if this um, application were be, to be refused, this material would all be dug up, uh, put in a truck, uh, driven across Northern Ireland. Um, and we're not talking one truck, we're talking lots of trucks. Um, and it's the environmental consequences of that. So the best environmental solution is to leave the material where it is. And aside from all that, it's it's because the benefit this area can provide to the site, um, it, it's all in the the papers. But you know, this this site provides 
a very vital opportunity for hauliers to to stop to rest um and, and increasingly during the, the pandemic that's what they did um and uh and now i suppose and with the size of the trucks and, and you know as gabriel tells me the trucks continue to get bigger um we need to ensure that there's no conflict god forbid something would happen on the site um we've got to ensure that there's no safety issue arises from from vehicles turning on site i hope that helps council require if i can uh, i can uh, amplify any of that thanks um thanks brian for that answer uh, council mcguire again yeah just if, if there is a flood uh risk assessment done um just reading the fld1 uh all sources of flood risk to and from the proposed del development have been identified that's what it says if the flood risk assessments are done and then b says there are adequate measures to manage and mitigate any increase in flood risk arising from the development so would you say that is done i, I would uh, i suppose the mitigating is if they're vehicles they can be moved or would that be it, it, it's that and it's you know to think about what what is the actual consequence of leaving the material on site um on, on the site itself there will be there is a predicted change of 15 millimeters so it's the width of your baby finger um and it's less than that on land adjacent to the site so um and and one other thing i had mentioned was that you know without this development flood levels will be greater than um 600 millimeters um you know what, what we're talking about is a fraction of what, what will actually be the situation if this area floods it's it's negligible is is is, is what it is um and uh so it, it, yes, it's a combination of that, that it's um, negligible, negligible change and the fact that the, the risk is resolved by simply moving the vehicles. Thanks, Brian. Okay, uh, one further um, questions, well, one further person, certainly, anyway, uh, both questions for you, Councillor Gallagher. Thank you. Um, thank you, Brian. Um, I have a couple of questions. I... Um, and you mentioned there about 67 jobs. Is there a potential risk to those jobs? Should this not go through? And I have another question, it's probably taking it maybe a wee bit on a different, and I'll put this question to the officers as well, but you see, when you were talking about the history back in 2014 and it being refused, and one of the reasons by the, the PAC was that it wasn't of regional significance. And knowing this area now, like in 2014, there wasn't so much chat about Brexit. But in 2023, you know, uh, we're seeing that this area and the significance of this area, do you think has it increased? in the sense of, you know, the reality being it is a, a European frontier. And is that like an visit and the end of the future plans for the site? Thanks, uh, Councillor Gallagher. Go ahead. Uh, Brian, I'm sure you heard those questions. I did, I did, Chair. Thanks very much. And thanks, Councillor Gallagher. Um, I suppose in terms of the first question around the 67 jobs and the, the consequence of this development not receiving planning permission, if you can imagine, if we don't put in place these measures to take HGVs out of the way, then very quickly, this is a site that's going to become choked. It's not going to be a site that people are going to want to visit. Um, they're, you know, I suppose if they can't get into it, if, and again, kind of a worst case scenario, if the HGVs can't park within the site, well, where are they going to park? going to park along the edge of the Lifford Road, they're going to be up in the curb. Um, this, you know, it, it could all become very undesirable very quickly um, if we can't find some way of segregating out HGVs and, and other cars that visit the site. It's an attractive complex, you know, Gabriel's got a very successful business there. Um, so again, putting the measures in place and, and, and yeah, otherwise it, it will threaten the jobs on the site if the complex can't operate at its um, at its full potential. Um, the other question, I suppose, in terms of the regional significance point, and, and I know that was something that the PAC considered. Um, it, regional significance is a high test. 
Um, the, the land all around uh, Gabriel's development there, what was known as the Three Rivers Project, that, that was regionally significant. I mean, it's accepted that all of the land around Gabriel's site uh, can be developed. Those, those planning permission granted there previously. Um, so it, there's a very high test for regional significance. I do agree with you that you know, Gabriel's location is very strategic and he found that through COVID. Um, it's a, a very ironic that, that, that you know, DFI's approach to traffic figures because the reality for Gabriel through COVID was that he was busier than ever. Um, you know, local people wanting to uh, top up shop, um, you know, shop local, and then with the increased haulier activity, um, you know, that, 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 that all was increased business for him. So I suppose it does speak to what you're saying, which is it, it is a very strategic location. That's what makes it busy. That's what makes it attractive. Um, and you can see that, you know, going forward that that's, that's going to continue. And I think that's why, that's why we're here. That's why we're trying to get approval for a proposal that will make the site safer to operate. I hope that helps. Yep. Thank you. Um, thanks, Brian. And congratulate Councillor Gallagher, actually. He's the first man that's ever actually squeezed Brexit into a planning committee. <laughs> there's always there's always a first poll. Um, okay. Any other questions from any members um, uh, for for uh, Brian or Connor? No. Okay. Sit with us, um, gentlemen. Um, uh, can I now uh, welcome... As I pointed out, either there's, there's two elected representatives who have expressed their support for uh, the application, and the first one I'm going to welcome uh, to the committee is um, uh, Daniel McCrossan, MLA. Daniel, as with um, uh, Brian, you'll have an initial five minutes to, um, well, actually, you have five minutes basically to, to address the committee, um, uh, and I'll invite you to do so whenever you're comfortable to start. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you to the committee and the officers um, uh, for considering this application. I'm speaking today uh, to, uh, in favour uh, of uh, the application and to overturn the uh, decision of the officers. Um, I do believe this is a very important site. And before I get into the detail of it, Chair, I think it's important that I do declare an interest. To, I'm a co-director of a company which owns the Railway Baronstraban that's widely known and my partner uh, is also a director of this local family business and a member of that family business making these planning applications. So uh, I just want to clear that at the outset. Uh, obviously, Chair, this is a long-standing family business. They're on their 30th year, and I want to congratulate the Dolan family for a, a very successful uh, business on this 30th year and for providing vital employment to this area, particularly in very difficult times. Uh, and let's be uh, under no estimation, Chair, this, chair, this site is significant. Uh, this site symbolized something very difficult many years ago. And uh, Mr. Dolan, through his own vision and, and determination, eroded many barriers on this uh, interface, if you like, uh, on the border area and created a very vibrant business, which has uh, 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 provided huge levels of employment on this very vibrant site. Uh, the application allows uh, in itself, Chair, for extra uh, parking adjacent to uh, the uh, restaurant area of the business complex and anyone familiar with the site will realize uh, that this is a, a fairly busy facility but it allows for hgv vehicles to park safely and avoid causing congestion within the site and you can see that in practice on any visit that you take to uh, the area uh, the size of hgv vehicles can't be underestimated either they have grown significantly in size over the last 20 years much more so than when mr dolan opened this business so obviously as is natural with business you have to expand and evolve to meet the demands of business and obviously the needs of the area as well. Uh, HGV vehicles park here at night and that can be very clearly seen and there isn't a wider facility in the local area uh, for uh, such. So Mr Dolan and the Dolan family providing vital support for HGV drivers doing a very important job in supporting our economy uh, might I add but it also in terms of the day-to-day -day running of this business it takes HGV vehicles off the main road uh, uh, which also prevents uh, blocking that main road from Lifford and Straban and also blocking the entrances. So it takes them in off that route and there's somewhere safe for them to park. It also avoids congestion and improves the safety, absolutely improves the safety of the site. Also in terms of deliveries, which is an essential part of this business, uh, there's very significant size HGV vehicles that need to be able to enter in through the entrance of the site and get out safely. And without this uh, filled ground area, it would not be possible uh, for that to function in a safe way. 
It is the reality that unfortunately 20 years ago, Mr. Dolan received per, received per advice, but I can tell you he has spent a huge amount of time, effort and costs have been incurred, significant costs, to try and rectify this problem. And he's done everything within his power to get this right. But the reality is, is very, very clear. Uh, this would be hugely detrimental for the employment on the site, for the business generally, and obviously uh, for the demand on the business. And we have to remember as well, this is one of the last surviving petrol stations in a town the size of Straban. And there's huge demand on its services. It is relied on by local people. It is a necessary and essential service, which has been vitally uh, vital, particularly in the difficult times we came through via COVID. Uh, and there's all sorts of businesses, the local community and emergency services available at the site uh, as well. Um, the, 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 this site, Chair, uh, as I've said, uh, it's very obvious that this, this is absolutely needed. There's been very, very uh, little issues with the site generally since this has been put in. Uh, and, and as someone that is speaking in support of it, I know uh, from being very familiar with the site that it is absolutely essential uh, that this uh, receive planning uh, permission today. Uh, as I've said, uh, Mr. Dolan and the family have spent many, many years trying to rectify this problem to find a suitable uh, uh, solution to this. And the only solution really is that that, that, that that could not survive without this ground and jobs could not be sustained without it either. They depend heavily on that. And also in terms of the safety of the site, uh, as I've said, this absolutely enhances the safety of the site. To touch on Paul, Mr. Gallagher's uh, 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 points is absolutely right. This is a vital area now. The riverine is key, and I know Mr. Geller has been very, very uh, clear on his support for that, as as we all are. And it's an important project, as has the Three Rivers, which is a significantly regional, a regionally significant project. So this area is of huge importance to the entry of Straban. It's the gateway between Donegal uh, uh, and Tyrone, and it's one that I, I want to see further enhanced as time goes on. I absolutely support the application. I would encourage uh, members to support uh, the application over turn the decision chair uh, uh, and they can't stress enough the importance of it for employment for the local area and uh, absolutely for the Dolan family. Uh, thank you chair. Okay thank you uh, Daniel. Um, uh, just to advise members actually you don't put questions to the, the, the supporters uh, uh, in, in relation to these matters so I'm sure you all knew that but uh, I, I didn't hear you being addressed as Mr. <laughs> By the way, um, thank you, Daniel. So, Daniel, sit tight. I'm going to move across now and I, I welcome Councillor Michaela Boyle. Um, Michaela, hopefully you're hearing us loud and clear. And uh, as I explained to others, of course, you'll have um, the requisite five minutes as well to address the committee. So, uh, Michaela, you're very welcome. And whenever you're comfortable to start, um, I invite you to do so. Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you to uh, members of the committee and officers um, for allowing me to speak today to this application. Um, and uh, just at the outset, to concur with um, everything that uh, the MLA has said in regards to the application. Um, uh, as everyone knows, this application is for extra parking spaces uh, at this well-known, very busy, uh, long-established family business. Uh, the uh, complex adjacent to the site um, comprises of a number of different businesses that offer a large number of services that serves not only the Straban town but the wider border uh, area and also more importantly provides, as been said, safe parking and resting areas for, for HGV uh, and long distance lorry drivers. And indeed, people travelling through this busy border corridor area. Um, over the years, the success of the restaurant on, uh, uh, on the site adjacent, uh, the, known as the Traveller's Rest, has proven that this space is needed to accommodate the many people passing through here on a daily basis. Uh, the restaurant, uh, shop and other businesses uh, are all open almost seven days a week. And uh, I do know, Chair, um, people from all over the island of Ireland and further afield do use uh, this area, the restaurant and the restrooms, as a designated safe place to stop over on their journey due to the location uh, where it's at um, in the northwest region. And, and, and I do believe it is of regional significance, this area. Um, you know, obviously, um, it is a designated, designated signature area and will become that once we get the riverine um, 
over the line. Um, the need for extra parking space um, is of high importance to the continuation of this business. Mr Dolan employs local people, some of whom that I know that have been employed there since the establishment of the businesses. Um, and indeed, some of them have left school and gone in to be employed there and are still working there um, for a long number of years. Um, as uh, Daniel said, I'm aware Mr Dolan filled uh, uh, in terms of the, the, the fill. Um, it was a high standard of soil from land close by, but uh, however, at that time, it was some bad advice he received. But since that, I know um, Mr Dolan has worked extremely hard um, to best rectify the issues over the years. Um, and, uh, as Daniel said, spending thousands of pounds in doing so. Um, also, I've listened to uh, Brian Kelly's comments and remarks, and I would be aware also that if removal of the fill um, should have to proceed after its 20 years in situ, it could cause um, environmental challenges. Um, the extra space is used solely for the purpose of extra parking for the customers. Um, if, I believe if Mr Dolan's application is not overturned with an approval today, then as others have said also, he can no longer provide the safe service to his customers, putting the many jobs and, uh, and indeed the businesses in jeopardy. Um, Local people um, work here. Um, obviously, they have mortgages, they have rents, they are ratepayers in our district, uh, who in turn, with their wages, are paying back into the local economy. Um, so, I, I, I would urge members um, to take on board the comments and considerations from from Mr. Brian Kelly, also in regards to to um, all of the consequences, um, you know, that this would have. Um, should this approval not be overturned today. But again, uh, Chair, thank you um, for the support um, today and allowing us to come here. And I would urge everybody to uh, support the recommendation to approve this application. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Boyle. Um, right, okay. Thank you, Michaela. All right, members. Um, Councillor Barr indicated in the chat box, and certainly addressed me in the chat box. Councillor Barr, do you have a question for some, for anybody that obviously who isn't the two elected representatives? Do you have a further question for Brian Kelly or or um, Conor O'Hara? Uh, no, I have no questions at this stage, Chair. Just right. uh, just wishing to make a comment. Oh, all right, right. We'll come back to you on 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 that. Okay, uh, Councillor Barr, if you don't mind. Right, that's that's, that's dead on. Okay, um, so. Members, um, you've heard from the applicants, um, supporters. Uh, has anybody got any questions they wish to put to our officer team? Um, Councillor Gallagher. Uh, and again, it was raised there over a number of speakers there that the, the, has it been explored the potential hazards of uncovering 20 years of stuff materials being buried. Uh, and, and my second question was on the apology. Brian Kelly was around. Do you know where it was said that <clears throat> the PAC back in 2014, I'll bring it in again, <laughs> you know, that that was way before Brexit uh, and a, a way somebody making a decision this area wasn't uh, of uh, regional significance. But uh, we now have Brexit, where we have, and this is a strip uh, that is, in my opinion, would be of considerable significance uh, at being frontier, you know, of the European Union. Uh, and uh, for me, personally, for, for businesses to close, uh, and, and we, we've seen very recently in Straban, a number of businesses getting demolished. I mean, that was a, a plan by a decision to be this committee, and, and there was job losses. I uh, and we were told at a certain time we'd be guaranteed job losses. But getting back to this, if this was the close, then it would start pushing the frontier further and further uh, back into Straban, which I wouldn't like to see. You know, but the question being, I. Uh, 
has this area changed in regional significance since Brexit? Oh, you put that question. To, it's a big question. Um, uh, I'll certainly put it to the officers, Commissioner Gallagher. Uh, was it given consideration? Is the was point? It, yeah, that's the question, right? Okay, so was that would that have been given any consideration? I'll put that to. I think Suzanne's going to take it. Okay. Uh, so, um, Councillor Gallagher, two questions. Uh, in terms of the removal of the infill, okay, the infill is inert. But we have no information has been provided as part of this application to allow us to consider that the removal of this waste would be an environmental concern, for example, you know, through its actual removal, digging it out, taking it away. That's something that we haven't been able to consider because nothing has been submitted to us. Um, we, you know, something like that may or may not have determined weight if we had have had it in front of us. We don't have it. It has been cited today um, and in, in a number of statements, but we don't have that information, therefore. <laughs> Uh, in terms of the regional significance, Brexit alone has not been considered as a as a determining factor for this extension to this business. Um, it, that would be, you know, if members feel that that's a determining factor today, that's entirely up to members. But that's not, uh, you know, we are looking at this as an extension to a business essentially. It's um, prov provision of four HGV parking bays. Um, I totally appreciate the issues that have been raised today in terms of the the you know the extent of the business. Um, but I mean, if members feel that that's the determining factor, then that's something that members can, can weigh up and as part of their decision making. Thanks. Thank you. Suzanne, okay with that? Councillor Gellar? Yep, thank you. Any other questions for officers? Councillor McGuire? Just wondering, uh, when the, the land, that piece of land was filled, was there ever an enforcement taken on that? Yeah. Yeah, so um, there has... I suppose members, it's it's important at the outset to say that this application is to retain the infill, whether or not there's enforcement or not on it. You know, we're looking at it against the policy criteria, irrespective. There has been uh, a significant enforcement, which I think was the the reason the original application was submitted back pre council, um, and then obviously it was dealt with by the Plan and Appeals Commission. Nothing has changed in terms of policy. But there has been, you know, it hasn't been removed. This application has been submitted again, and we're back to the same points. Okay, thank you, Suzanne. Anybody else got any questions for Suzanne or anybody up here at the top table? Um, okay, bear with me, more. Um, with no questions on line, uh, Councillor Raymond Barr, you indicated you, you wanted to make a comment. Um, but how long are we sick? Um, but I'm just going to, the officers are indicating that they wish to address something here. They haven't told me what it is, so it's good news to me. So go ahead. So just um, to follow up on Suzanne's point in relation to the regional significance issue, um, similar to the response which Suzanne gave in relation to the um, uh, nature of the material and the environmental impact, um, there is no evidence before this committee today uh, in relation to any change in the regional significance of the um, businesses or between 2014 and now as a result of that. So um, it may be that such evidence could be provided, um, but it hasn't been provided to date. Um, and therefore, might re that might represent a challenge for this committee to base a decision on that particular point. Yeah, just it's um, previously someone raised a question in regard to the reason for refusal. It was actually the agent. And I just think for clarification, I would like Suzanne to come back in about why that reason for refusal um, remains as a recommendation of officers, just to clarify that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Maura. Yes, yeah, so it was it was the agent, Mr. Kelly, had, had raised the issue that the report says that there's no issue and it complies with AMP2. Um, we should have, we, that shouldn't be there. We should have changed that because clearly what Rhodes are saying is, look, the site layout uh, doesn't actually, the, the proposed site layout doesn't actually reflect the current layout on the ground, okay? Um, and that further amended plans would be required to accurately reflect the layout um, and so in terms of we would take that as you know 
in terms of AMP2, it, it hasn't met that yet until we have a site layout that roads would be happy with in terms of park and turn and, uh, you know, access, entry, egress, all that. So that's the uh, reason for the query. Hope Thanks, Suzanne. Councillor Gallagher again. It's just it's a question for the solicitor. <laughs> right. But I, and the question being, it was brought up here today about a decision that the PAC made in 2014. All Zabba's all pointing out are around the significant, because the, then it says there wasn't uh, significance regional, regionally. All, all Zabba's pointing out is there has been a change, because it was brought up in 2014, there has, and we don't need evidence, you know, in the sense of it is 2023 and there has been Brexit. So there has there has been a, a it wasn't about whether there was evidence or not. It was just by the fact that there has been a change in the circumstances completely around Brexit. And this side of the this border has been pulled out of Europe and the other side is still on Europe. That's just a fact. That's so it's not about having to produce Evidence. It's a fact that there's been a change of circumstances since 2014, when because it was brought up by the PAC, and now there's a complete difference. It is a fact that Brexit has occurred. There's no disputing that um, whatsoever. Um, if the council committee, if the planning committee is minded to approve any application, um, it must and, and therefore go against the officer recommendation that is contained within a report which recommends refusal, then it is the responsibility of the council planning committee to provide reasons for any such decision that it makes. Those reasons cannot be pulled out of thin air. They have to be evidentially based. Um, and therefore, one cannot turn around and say that as a result of Brexit, something is necessarily now regionally significant. One needs evidence to support that conclusion. That evidence may be something that can be supplied, but it is not something which is before us today. Yeah. I think that clears that up. Thanks, Philip. Um, it's interesting, I suppose, I, I, but I know where you're coming from, Councillor Geller, but I think we, we all understand the, the explanation that's given to us by uh, our city solicitor. Um, I think what Councillor Geller is perhaps driving at is if the PAC will look at this again, they might look at it a different way because of Brexit. But that look, that's over to yourselves, you can, whether you think that's part and parcel of the uh, debate. Any other questions for the officers? Um, uh, if not, then I will uh, welcome Councillor Raymond Barr. Raymond, you said you, you wanted to make a comment earlier on, so go ahead, yeah. Councillor Barr. Thank you, Chair. It's just, I, I see the reasons for refusal as being a bit ambiguous. ambiguous. Um, the flood risk will appear to be so minimal that it has to make a huge difference, and therefore rendering, in my opinion, the, the difficulty around parking minimal. The positive impact of uh, approving the a proposal for, for example, employment, etc. In my opinion, far it weighs a negative impact. Uh, a refusal would produce, you know, the application takes more boxes than that, you know. And my opinion, just demand needs to progress, and I think we we need to be aware of that when making decisions like this, you know. So, if if if, if for example, I, I would like to propose that the recommendation to refuse be overturned. Thank you, Councillor Park. Can I can I also point out that if you're making that proposal uh, to overturn the officer recommendation, we will need planning reasons for it. We will need valid reasons for doing so. Um, so, members, obviously, Councillor Barr has proposed that we um, we overturn the the recommendation to refuse. That needs a seconder, uh, and again, uh, to whoever that seconder might be, um, uh, we would need valid. Reasons for why we'd be able to overturn it. Okay, yes, go ahead, Councillor Gallagher. I 
Uh, right, but you're not on your microphone, so if you want to address that, it needs to be. It needs to be. Sorry, it's just it's just like a protocol element that Councillor Barr's proposal was to overturn, where and it should be if, if he wants to remake it, that it is not to accept the officer's recommendation, and then if that's voted on. See what I, I see where you're coming from, but it's probably just semantics, really. I, you know, I mean, but like I'll let the city solicitor in on it, but you know, my view would be on Councillor Bowers proposed what he's proposed, he is effectively saying that we're not going to accept the officer recommendation, but you can't vote on that. Councillor Bower, back to you. Thank you, John. As I said, John, I, I just as, as I see the flood risk being minimal. Uh, as was alluded to earlier on, like, you know, the size of your small finger, you know, I, I just, I, I can't see that as a, a valid reason for, uh, for refusing the application. So as your proposal, Councillor Power, that we do not accept the officer's recommendation, yeah, yeah, and that we would move to an approval. That's your proposal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, members, that's the proposal. Now, um, as clarified by Councillor Barr, is there a seconder for that proposal, Councillor McGuire? And second, uh, the rural remainder and Strabane area plan one, two, three. Why not? But then, you know, if one, two, three point two. And one two three point three, which you know uh, refer to uh, non-residential uh, development, and basically you know you know the ins and outs of it yourselves. Less restrictive policy, and uh, as well as what we have heard from uh, Mr. Kelly as well, uh, the impact of the flooding as well, uh, as was said by Councillor Barr, it, it, it's minimal, and of course, cars can be moved. So, just on that, I'd like to second the proposal, Chair. Okay, thank you, Councillor McGuire. We have a we have a proposer and we have a seconder. But before we go to the vote, Councillor Paul Gallagher, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. And, and again, I, I think I see, and it was highlighted in, 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 the, in the in the report and, and in the presentation by the officers. This site is operational. That's no, that's for me. That's the key. It's operational. I and. I think it, it, it does constitute an exception in the sense of uh, 67 jobs, uh, potential to get lost in Straban has a massive impact. And very recently we've seen in Straban a loss of 50 jobs and people were on the streets uh, and they weren't happy about it. Do you know what I mean? So I'm telling you, it's, for me, it constitutes, constitutes an exception. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Gallagher. Yeah, uh, City Solicitor just wants to address us before we um, we move to the vote, members. Yeah, just before we move to the vote, just looking to get a little bit of clarity um, in and around the rationale here for the decision, because I think there's perhaps a slight distinction to be drawn, critical distinction to be drawn, uh, between the proposal from Councillor Barr and perhaps what has come um, subsequently. My understanding of Councillor Barr's proposal um, was that for the reasons that he set out, um, he was suggesting that um, policy FLD1 should be set aside, um, which is what uh, 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 would be in line um, with perhaps previous uh, decisions that um, of the uh, Judicial Review Court that we've discussed uh, in this court, um, rather than suggesting that, in fact, this uh, proposal fell within one of the exceptions to policy FLD1, um, which I think is a, a difficult argument to make. So I think the proposal which is on the floor today uh, from Councillor Barr is to set aside policy FLD1, uh, rather than to suggest that it falls within one of the exceptions to the policy. Chair? Sure. Okay. Just think you want me. Uh, if Councillor Barr could confirm that, and perhaps the seconder could confirm that as well, then we could go from there. Okay, uh, Councillor Raymond Barr. So uh, I think you heard what uh, Philip was saying there. C can you confirm that's that's really what you're thinking was? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, no problem. I, I I can confirm that. 
Okay. Councillor McGuire? Yeah, second that. Okay, um, members, so we're, we've got a proposal from Councillor Raymond Park, um, Seconder and Councillor McGuire. And again, we'll move through the uh, vote formally. Maura? Thank you, Chair. So, members, this is item five, and the proposal is not to accept the officer's recommendation. Alderman Alan Breslin? Four. Thank you. Alderman Keith Kerrigan? Four, Maura. Thank you. Alderman Drew Thompson? Four, Maura. Thank you. Councillor Jason Barr? Four. Thank you. Councillor Raymond Barr? Four. Thank you. Councillor John Boyle? Four. Thank you. Councillor Angela Dobbins, his apologies. Councillor Paul Gallagher? Four. Thank you. Councillor Christopher Jackson? Four. Thanks. Councillor Dan Kelly, his apologies. Councillor Patricia Logue, his apologies. Councillor Kieran McGuire? Four. Thank you. Councillor Philip McKinney, his apologies. And Councillor Sean Mooney? Four. Thank you. Yeah, unanimous. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And I think there's a point just in terms of processing that Suzanne wants to address. Um, just from an officer perspective in terms of how we process the application. Yeah. Thank you. So clearly, members, we will, you know, road service, DFI roads require further information in terms of layout. So we will go ahead and request get that layout. Liaise with DFI roads, we will have to bring it back um to to, to planning committee. So um just bear in mind that we will not be able to issue that. We would need to go ahead with that. It's a protected route. Okay, I think we we got that. Thanks, Suzanne. Um so members, uh the committee have um unanimously uh supported the proposal to overturn that uh, officer recommendation. Um members conscious that uh the next item six is also um with reference to this particular site, we do have the same speakers who uh, potentially will want to address the committee in relation to that. However, uh, we're well past the two hour mark now, and uh, as is usual, we will take um, a 10 minute break. So can I just ask those who uh, are waiting to um, address the committee again in relation to our, our next item uh, uh, to uh, afford the committee um, a 10 minute uh, comfort break and Stay online, uh, we, and we'll come back um, at an around four thirty or so. Okay, so we'll take a ten minute break, members.
Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for uh, all of those who uh, waited patiently online. Um, uh, and again, we are now going to move to uh, application um, item number six on our agenda, which is LA 11 2022 forward slash 0217 forward slash F. Um, uh, we, uh, as I pointed out before we went into the recess there, uh, we do have a few speakers on this one as well. It's in relation to the same site, but a different application, as you all, I'm sure, are well aware. Uh, and so we will begin with the presentation again. I'll pass that over to Laura. So application LA 11 2022 f is that for the retention of the existing buildings, um, which include an ice cream parlour store um, in class A1 retail unit in lieu of an existing hot food takeaway and associated external seating. And this again is located at 19 Lafford Road, Strabane, and the recommendation is to refuse. Um, so, um, as before, this is the same red outline um, for the application site. Um, the, it shows an aerial overview as well of the site. Um, so the buildings which are the subject of this application are located here, kind of in the northeastern corner of the site. Um, the site's located between Lufford and Straban and the countryside is defined by the Straban area plan. Um, these are just some images um, of the building which is the subject of the application. Um, and you can just see the external seating area um, kind of towards the front of the building there. Um, so the, again, this is just images um, which you may, which you've seen before um, from looking from the strand direction um, towards the application site there at the top of the screen and from the leftward side looking towards the site. So this is the policy context um, under which this application um, was assessed. It's outlined in the planning report also. Um, these are just some drawings that were submitted along with the application, just showing the buildings, which you've seen in the damages above, and the location of the buildings there within the, the overall site um, at Dolan's. Um, so in terms of consultation responses, um, environmental health had no objection with regard to noise and odour. Um, with this being um, an ice cream parlour. Um, again, HED historic monuments were consulted due to the archaeological site um, and they had no objections to the proposal. Um, DFI Rivers advised that the site lies within the 1 in 100 undefended floodplain um, and the development doesn't permit it unless it meets one of the exceptions. Um, DFI Roads advised that the site access is onto the protected route. Um, so they've analysed information that was submitted along with the application um, and they have concluded that this proposal will represent intensification onto the protected route. So the protected route is the road between Lufford and Strabane. Um, and NI Water were also consulted and they have no objections to the proposal from sewage and water supply perspective and have proposed conditions of approvals granted. Um, so again, in terms of the principle of this um, development, because it's in the countryside, we first um, look at PPS 21, um, which directs us to the relevant plan and policy statements. So again, in terms of this one, to establish the principle, we have to look firstly at PPS 15 policy FLD1, um, which states that development won't be permitted within the 1 in 100 Fluvial floodplain unless the applicant can demonstrate that the proposal constitutes an exception to the policy or that it's overriding regional importance. Um, so it's officers' um, opinion that this information hasn't been received um, and that we don't did to demonstrate that it's overriding regional importance or that it meets any of the exceptions as outlined on the policy. Um, furthermore, um, because this site is a retail, for the, as this application is for retail within the countryside, um, we have to look at the SPPS, um, which directs retail into town centres and states that the development of an appropriate retail facilities in the countryside must be resisted. Um, so, as officer's opinion, this wouldn't constitute one of the types of retail and um, facilities which should be located within the countryside. Um, so, whilst we um, don't think that this proposal is acceptable in principle, again, we consider it under the all our relevant plan and policies, um, policy CTY 13 and 14 of PPS 21. Um, as outlined in the report, um, we haven't raised any concerns with, with regards to the design um, of the proposal or the rural character of the area, given where it's located. Um, in terms of um, amenity or human health, there's no issues um, in terms of noise or disturbance. Um, so therefore, the proposal complies with the SPPS in that respect. Um, there's no concerns with regards to the natural and built heritage features. Um, 
the development is already completed. Um, so there's no, um, there won't be any impacts. Um, and in terms of PPS3, it's considered that the proposal will result in intensification on the existing of the existing access onto the protected route, so the access from the overall site onto Lefford Road. Um, so there was one letter of support received, um, which is presented as a laid item. Um, just to summarise it, that it was a long-standing family business. The units replaced existing units, which were there for over 15 years, um, and there is um, no traffic at the ice, increase at the ice cream parlour. Um, so we can, in terms of those um, points raised, um, it, we, we, I suppose we're not disputing that it is a long-standing family business and it's something that previously existed at the site. Um, but these units were built without plan permission and they're contrary to um, policy FLD1 in principle and the SPPS. And in terms of the traffic generation, that's been considered by DFI roads and it's considered that um, this will result in intensification um, from the site as a result of these units onto the protected route. Um, so just again to summarise, the site's located within the floodplain. Um, it's not acceptable in principle. It's contrary to policy FLD1 of PPS 15. <clears throat> it's not considered an appropriate retail facility within the countryside, contrary to the SPPS. And it will result in intensification under the protected ridge, which is contrary to policy AMP3 of PPS 3. And therefore, refusal is recommended for the reasons as which are set out in the planning report. Thank you, Laura. Um, so again, members, it's... We'll run it the way we ran the last item. We have the same speakers. Um, so we'll hear from uh, Brian Kelly and Conor O'Hara uh, first. Uh, then we'll go to uh, Daniel McCross in the MLA. And then we'll go to uh, Councillor Michaela Boyd. So you're all welcome back and thanks for hanging on for us. So, um, Brian, I'll pass it back yourself at uh, the usual five minutes um, uh, to address the committee in relation to this particular um, application. Um, and we'll start whenever you're comfortable. Thanks, Chair. And just before I do start, um, can I just say thank you for uh, to the members for the, the decision on the last application. It, it means a lot to the Dolan family, and um, I'm always very grateful. Um, in relation to this application, uh, just to set out the background for you, um, in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic, uh, the Dolan family invested 150000 to replace two redundant retail units, introducing another re revenue re uh, generator within the complex. Their objective was to improve resilience to the family business and to protect the workforce at a time of, of considerable uncertainty. Through this investment, the family has managed to protect staff, as I mentioned previously, it's 67 employees. Um, and at a, at a critical time for the business, they're, they're now in their 30th year. It was not appreciated by the family that the upgrade of the unit would require planning permission. Um, it was originally conceived as a drive through uh, and that operated during the pandemic, but now it, it operates as a as a shared visit or, or, or trip within the site for those uh, purchasing fuel or groceries. Um, there, the drive through is, is will be resolved or, or well has been resolved um, with the uh, with the infill application. Um, again, there's no no objection from a third party. So a few observations just on the refusal reasons. Um, in relation to the first refusal reason that the proposal is contrary to FLD uh, one of PPS fifteen. The ice cream uh, parlour unit is on the site of and replaces two units that, that exist on the site, um, utilising the original ground levels. And, and PPS 15 identifies the replacement of an existing building as an exception to policy FLD1. Uh, our, sites, our assessment of the site's eligibility as an exception mirrors the approach taken by the plan authority uh, with the immediately adjoining site, uh, number 15 Lifford Road, and that's reference J2012-0162F. And also for the replacement um, of storage and distribution warehouse with retail sales facilities, uh, where, where the planning authority took the view um, that the existing use on the site are sufficient grounds to be considered exceptions to the policy. So the existing uses on the site um, and, uh, and those facilitated as an exception to FLD1. In relation to the, the second refusal reason uh, that the proposal is contrary to paragraph 6.279 of the SPPS, the final part of that paragraph states that the clear objective of the policy is that, I'm quoting here, all policies and proposals must ensure there'll be no unacceptable adverse impact on the vitality and viability of an existing centre. The whole ice cream phenomenon that took off during the pandemic capitalised on circumstances where customers 
were arriving to a, a petrol station and you know by by being there purchasing fuel and groceries they might be likely to, to purchase an ice cream i suppose during the dark days of the pandemic you know it, it brought a bit of joy to people um that there was something different something new available to them um these are customers who had a dual purpose it was groceries fuel and the ice cream and you know it, it in, in that way it doesn't pose a threat to the vitality and viability of the town center these are these are people who are coming to the site already Considering how previous plan applications have approached this, I will look again to the to the application on the adjoining site, 15 Lifford Road, where the plan authority had assessed an application for storage and distribution warehouse retail sales. It noted, and again I quote, there are retailing units immediately to the northwest and southeast. Under these circumstances, with existing retailing in the area, I this is the case officer with that application, I do not find it expedient to exercise the policy of restricting the development to non-retail operations. So that was the consideration of the application on the adjoining site. I'm sure we'll all accept that the application of the countryside policy to this area of the Camels Hump Lifford Road speaks to the, the age of the plan really and, and requires us to, to apply our judgment. Lifford Road is very much urban in nature and has come about uh, through the evolution of the former security installation and the customs outpost. Previous planning approvals within the Dolan complex itself at 15 Lifter, uh, 15. Uh, Lifford Road and the Three Rivers project envisage this as an extension of the of the urban area of Straban. In relation to the final refusal reason that the that the proposal is contrary to AMP3 of PPS3, RPS consultant engineers and Connors on the call here use the TRICS database to determine the level of trips associated with the level of development. The number of trips uh, between the hours of seven o'clock in the morning, seven o'clock in the evening, was calculated to be 1,124 arrivals and 1,114 departures. So all in 2,238 trips. Then a traffic survey was commissioned on the site on the 21st of April, 2021, when the drive through ice cream parlor was operational. This survey indicated that on the day, on that day, between the hours of seven in the morning, and seven in the evening, 2,181 total trips, arrivals and departures were recorded. On this basis, the recorded number of trips at the site on that day um, with the ice cream power fully operational is less than the number of trips that are associated with the permitted development that's on the site based on the TRICS database analysis. Therefore, there is no predicted intensification of, site, of trips at the site over the existing permitted level with the ice cream parlor operational. I also note the approach DFI road, uh, DFI roads is taken, where they're factoring up the traffic, uh, applying a factor to the traffic figures to account for pre-COVID levels. And whilst we do not disagree with the calculation, we don't agree that the pre-COVID figure represents intensification. If this was the case, then all developments analysed during the pandemic would, in fact, result in intensification. We believe that these figures effectively represent the same thing. A daily traffic volume associated with the site calculated for two different assessment periods pre and during the pandemic. The difference in trips doesn't represent um, intensification. Only a survey of daily trips on a different day under different conditions in the same way that you might compare, um, you know, counting traffic at a shopping centre on a normal day against uh, Christmas Eve. I hope that's Excuse clear. Me, Mr. Kelly, yeah. sorry, I'm sorry, but your five minutes speaking rights is now complete. Okay. Brian, uh, um, um, five minutes goes past very quickly. I'm sure you'll agree. If you want to take just a minute more to sum it up, uh, if you yes. that, that's necessary, Brian, I'll, I'll let you do that. Ten seconds, Chair, would be enough for Go me. Ahead. Um, the final thing to say is that the Donald family themselves are surprised to learn of DFI's proposed approach to factoring up the survey where the reality on the ground during the pandemic, and I said this earlier, was that significant increase in business with customers preferring to shop local for top-up items and with the additional business from haulage companies where the Dolan station was ever popular as a layover, a kind of a rest stop. So again, just the approach of DFI to intensification for us, it, it doesn't stack up. Connor's here and he can answer any questions. But I'm chair, I'm great, grateful for the latitude. Thank you. Okay, Brian, you're welcome. Um, uh, so again, members, I'll uh, open it up to uh, questions to Brian and Connor if you feel it's necessary to ask in relation to this application. Anybody? Commissioner McGuire. Again, Chair, just the, the, the flood report and the traffic survey are there. If 
people want to see them. He has them done, like, you know, I asked that the last time as well, but they have been done. Okay, Brian. Go ahead. Yes, Chair. No, absolutely. You know, um, Mr. Dolan um, has invested here to demonstrate the evidence, um, the, 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 I suppose, the technical robustness of the planning application, and that includes the advice we obtain from uh, Macquarie Consulting Engineers. And, um, you know, it, uh, I suppose in this circumstance, it's different because there's, um, you know, it, it is the re replacing of, a, of an existing building. So um, it, it's, it's much more straightforward than, than previous planning application. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, we only need to look next door to how the previous, um, how the application of the neighbour was dealt with. Um, you know, it's just, you know, how, how do you apply a restriction to a building that's there already um, within, the, within the floodplain? Um, so, yeah, that's in relation to flooding and traffic survey. Well, you know, Connor's probably a better place to talk than me, but it's significant effort here, um, uh, you know, to try and um demonstrate that um there is no intensification issue here involving you know tricks analysis and then a, a survey and, and comparing the two chair can i pass to connor just to to, to comment if he wants yeah that's that's fine connor if, if, if you feel if anything you you want to add to that we'd be more than happy to hear it thanks chair um, I think Brian has covered it actually very, very well. He, he went through the detail. I'm happy to get into the detail a bit more if anybody wants to, but I think in terms of an overall sort of explanation, um, you know, we have done a robust assessment of the site um, and we don't believe there is a, a an intensification of the site. We just believe that the, the comparison of factoring up the trips effectively is counting a site in two different days. And relevant guidance would say that traffic volumes themselves can vary by 10% day to day. So all sites on different days would generate different types, type different amounts of traffic over the, the daily profile. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Connor. Members, any other questions for, for Brian and Connor before we move on? Any other, uh, Councillor Gellar? Uh, um, uh, I suppose, uh, let me see. Just know that well, one of the reasons for the refusal like, is intensification. Hi, uh, and uh, a, a question for Brian. I'm probably old enough to know that um, that uh, having this location on the border, uh, that from time to time over the last maybe 30, 40 years, the, the price of petrol and price of diesel can vary between the north and the south at any given time. It's one time it's very expensive in the north, and the next time it's very expensive uh, in the south and vice versa, and that changes uh, in a sort of five-year, ten-year cycle. But just in the sense of in the per permitted development, no, would you acknowledge that the change of price of petrol would could change that would naturally intensify the site anyway? Um, chair, through you. Go ahead. Yep. Yep. Yeah, it's a very astute observation. It, it, we've talked about that ourselves because I know that the, the Dolan family see a you know, huge fluctuation in, in business to the site depending on how the, the fuel is priced. Obviously, that all depends on the price at which Mr. Dolan uh, purchases, the, purchases the fuel himself. Um, but yeah, so it, it's, it can have a, a significant influence on, on traffic to the site on any day. Um, and... Uh, you know, I suppose again, it's just making sure that we're representative, and I think the the way in which RPS has approached this, it's it's you know it's robust and it's reflective of 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 what the circumstances are actually are at the site, and where you have you know the predicted level of traffic through the tricks analysis, and and then the actual surveying on the ground, um, the factoring up for kind of pre-COVID and post-COVID, I think we're getting into a very subjective analysis and. We're not we're not very easy with it comfortable with it um and uh because you can understand that you know traffic on the network is going to increase at the same rate as traffic on the site so when you compare the two the actual intensification of the access is it's, it's not any different in percentage terms if you understand so um look we i don't think we want to go down a rabbit hole with that but um i think what's most relevant is is the the analysis that we've presented thank you chair 
Thanks, Brian. I appreciate that you didn't take us down the rabbit hole with that as well. Um, you happy enough, Councillor Gallagher? Yeah. Um, it, it is an interesting um, observation, I have to say. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Mooney. Thank you, Chair. I'm um, just looking at one another few other reasons. The second one, um, I'm kind of struggling, with, but I'll be, maybe perhaps Brian could um, give me some um, views on it. It says here that proposals contrary to paragraph 6.279 of the SPPS for sustainable development, and that this is not considered an appropriate retail facility from the countryside. But when I was looking through the paper, um, Brian, um, what I noticed was that, especially the planning history, and for this actual site, there's about 16 entries. But if you look from the start, you can see that permissions were granted for erections of uh, petrol filling stations, shop, cafe, off-license exchange, bureau, and associated offices and stores. There was an extension to a restaurant and a restaurant as well. So I'm struggling to see what's, what the difference is between these previous or these um, former applications that were granted. And now, I mean, would you agree that this is, I mean, like, what would your view be on this here? Because for me, I'm struggling to see what the difference is. I mean, there's any previous um, applications that were granted on this one now, so I'd be happy to hear your views. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Mooney. Brian? Well, yeah, Councillor, I, I agree. And, um, you know, you look through that planning history and you can see that there's there's you know, there's a whole series of planning permissions which have, I suppose, established what the, the character, what the blend of uses is on this site. And um, and again on the adjoining site too. So um, it's just it, it's it's an area I suppose that's evolved over time, you know. And, and it's it's uh, you, you're all very familiar with the history, but um, it uh, it's 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 unusual. And 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 so far as then we're we're now looking to apply countryside policy to an area which is just so urban, um, you know, bridging between two towns. Um, and with all the, the various commercial enterprises that are along that road, um, to try and look at through a, a, a rural countryside policy lens, um, you know, I, I think it's just, it's um, you know, what's in the public interest, what's what's a balanced planning decision in these in these circumstances, and um, you know, the, the the proposal here is very much in tune with the other uses that have been approved previously on the site and on on adjoining sites. Um, and uh, you know clearly it's compatible with um, with the, the use of the site as it is, um, and it's it's certainly an improvement on what was there previously, um, which you know um, redundant buildings, not in great nick, um, and, and an investment made to to protect jobs on the site. So um, yeah, no, look, I agree, it, it, but it's um, it's an area unlike any other, and I suppose it just requires us to to use our judgment. Thank you, Brian. Um, members, anybody else, any other questions they'd like to address to Brian and Connor at this point? If not, we'll move on to the next element of it. Thanks, Brian. And again, Connor, um, uh, stand by, I'm sure uh, you'll want to remain in situ. Uh, before we do, we've got um, two further speakers. It's the same two that supported the previous application, and that's um, Daniel McCross and MLA and Councillor Michaela Boyle. So as per protocol, I'll ask Daniel to address the committee uh, with the requisite five minutes. So Daniel, I hope you're still with us. You're uh, welcome back. Uh, and whenever you want to start, um, and whenever you're comfortably start, and I invite you to do so. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you again to the officers and committee for considering this application. Uh, I am speaking in favour of this application to overturn the recommendation to refuse. Uh, this is an important uh, local business that employs uh, 14 people. Uh, there's been a significant investment of £150,000 uh, in this particular business uh, over the course of the last uh, uh, while, uh, and it has replaced two pre-existing units on the site, and it has vastly improved uh, the site as well, uh, Chair. Uh, local jobs are important, and, and many, many young people in particular rely on these particular jobs uh, in this area. I do often um, find it strange when we're looking at the Lifford to Straban Road uh, through uh, the guise of a, of, a, of, a, of a countryside lens, if you like. It's anything but that. In the immediate surrounding area, in particular in the two plots uh, neighbouring uh, the Dolan's complex, there is a motor parts, a significant one, uh, a tyre depot with three very large booths. 
kitchen and bathroom suppliers, exhaust centers, frame shops, bureau de changes. There's all sorts of activity, which would be quite strange to be found in a countryside environment. So it does show how out of date the local uh, plan is and, and that it does desperately need updated. I know there's great work going on to ensure that that happens. Also, even predating many of these businesses, uh, this road uh, was home to the former customs and excise checks. Uh, it was also uh, the former uh, armory barracks and uh, 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 there was various checkpoints along that road. Uh, so, you know, it has never been, and I'm sure many in this immediate Straban town centre area would struggle to ever define that road uh, as a country road. It is absolutely urban in nature uh, and in every single uh, possible way. Uh, this particular uh, addition to the site does add uh, to the site. And if, you rem if we all remember, and we do remember very, very clearly, Chair, uh, the times of COVID-19 were very, very difficult for a lot of our people in our communities. And Yum Yums, as it's called, did bring some joy and excitement to so many people. It allowed access to a service that many were prevented from accessing because a lot of us were not allowed to go into places to sit down or enjoy any form of hospitality. But through the unique ingenuity of the Dolan family and with them meeting the challenges of the times that we're in then and there, uh, they enabled people to access that and it did give people a great boost. Uh, they've done various amounts for local charitable organizations and everything through Yum Yums and the business is widely, widely popular uh, in the local area. If you're in the cafe, the restaurant that is established over 30 years at the Dolan site, uh, many come out of there and go directly across to uh, Yum Yums for an ice cream or dessert, if you like. And similarly, if you're in the site purchasing fuel or pet food or whatever, many people stop off at Yum Yums for uh, an ice cream. It is a very well run, very well managed business. And as I've said, it is uh, a replacement of uh, the existing uh, two units. And I think it's appropriate, Chair, I should have said at the start, similarly to the previous application, I must declare an interest, I should say, uh, as a co-director of a company, uh, as I've said, which owns the Railway Baron Straban. My partner is a co-owner uh, uh, and director of this company uh, and of this local family business making the application. I should have said that at the outset. But I can't stress enough, Chair, if we're looking at this in realistic terms, you'll realise very quickly the plan is out of date uh, and that this road very much is urban. This new addition to this site is, is a very strong improvement to the business or to the area. It also provides local employment uh, and is very, very popular uh, throughout. Uh, I, I just struggle with the countryside argument that is made. I should add also that the this business and the previous two units have been paying rates as local rate payers uh, to the council local authority for many, many years. Uh, uh, and the existing new addition to the site uh, uh, does so also. Uh, I would encourage members and thank them for their patience and their consideration of this. And I would encourage members to, of course, uh, support uh, the uh, overturning of the recommendation by the planners and approve this very important local business for uh, the local area. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Daniel. Um, uh, you kept it on the requisite five minutes, which we always appreciate. Um, but again, uh, appreciate your uh, your point of view in, re in relation to this. Uh, um, uh, we, of course, have a, another elected representative who is also supporting the application. So again, can I thank Councillor Michaela Boyle for bearing with us. Uh, and Michaela, uh, you know the drill, obviously. Um, so I'll give you the opportunity now. You've got five minutes if you wish to take the full five minutes. And so Michaela, over to yourself. Well, there, Chair, thank you. Uh, thanks to the committee members and to officers uh, once again. Um, I'll not take five minutes um, of your time. It'll be a few minutes. Um, but once again, just to concur with everything that Brian and Daniel has said before me, obviously this is retrospective planning application for the replacement of, of two business units that have been on the site for a long period of time. Um, those units were um, a bit dilapidated and, and um, obviously the Dolan family uh, once again um, diversified in terms of their business and replaced this by a new modern module, modular style building, um, which is now the site of a very popular ice cream parlour. Um, and uh, as others have said throughout the challenges of COVID-19 um, to all of the businesses, um, you know, this gave customers, um, and again, once again, not just the local people of the area, but from further afield, the opportunity um, to come here to, to drive through and purchase ice cream. And, you know, if they were in the shop or fueling up or whatever, 
Um, however, like everything else, people want um, shared uh, variety, they want flexibility and they want option. Um, and I'm seeing more, I'm from the area as is others, I'm seeing more, more and more families uh, want to make the visit to the ice cream parlour a memorable one. Um, you know, um, obviously we have our inclement weather conditions and, and um, unfortunately for the businesses, it is now experiencing less and less people that are no longer using the drive through option. So you do have less uh, cars coming through, um, you know, um, because people do want to take the opportunity to go in and sit down and have an ice cream on, on a cold day. Um, the, the application, I mean, I want to say also, um, you know, I, I want to gain um, Straban area plan, as others have said, to define this area as a countryside. Um, it, it does beggars belief a bit because this is an extension to the urban area of Straban and Lufford. Um, and I know, like, our, our local cinema complex is in the Lufford area. And, you know, and it's just great to see and it'll, it'll happen again now in the springtime. You have lots of families, lots of young people walking to the cinema who who come back and, and, and go into to the ice cream parlour to for a purchase. And and I know that because I, I have grandchildren and it's one of the things that they look forward to doing is going to the cinema to walk back over the bridge to go to the ice cream parlour for an ice cream. Um, obviously, you know, I, I want to say to you at the outset, the application, you know, uh, this application is not located on the full section of the site, um, and there's been no flooding issues or traffic congestion issues on this site. And again, Mr. Dolan and his extended family have been synonymous with providing good, well-run businesses and services for the local community and beyond. And I do know that health and safety to customers and all service users of the site has always been and will continue to be of paramount importance uh, to Mr. Dolan and his family. Um, you know, this does not pro pose any threat to any other users of the site. And uh, once again, I would ask members to take on board the comments from Mr. Kelly, um, you know, uh, in terms of what he has said um, about the technical end of things. Um, uh, Mr. Dolan's business has been there on that road before many other businesses have been there. And, and again, as I say, long may that continue. And I wish him every success with the, the ice cream parlour. Uh, so, Chair, I'd like to ask the committee to support um, the application in terms of the decision that the officers have come to to refuse to have that decision overturned to approve this application here today. Uh, thank you, Chair. A member. Thank you very much, Councillor Boyle. Um, of course, your your comments and, and Daniel's comments are be noted by by the committee, and appreciate you again. Appreciate both of you um, uh, uh, bearing with us in, in relation to addressing these particular matters. Um, okay, members. So, uh, if anybody nobody's got any further questions for Brian, um, then I'll move it across. Uh, okay. Members, anybody got any questions for the officer team in front of you? No questions for the officer team either. Oh, Councillor Barr, go ahead. No questions, but a proposal. Okay. Um, I'll come back. Yeah, I just it was interesting when Councillor Gallagher, when you when you mentioned that that whole back and forth for petrol. Scenario and threw me back to my teenage days, and I remember it very well because I was actually a petrol pump attendant mm -hmm. on the Bunkrana Road myself. It's the first job I ever had. Some would argue it was the best job I ever had, actually, to be fair. Um, uh, no worries when you're 17, you know what I mean. Um, however, um, uh, members, we um, have Councillor uh, Jason Barry wants to make a proposal to us. So, um, Jason, go ahead. Thank you, Chair, for letting me in. Um, that's to do with the refusal reason, uh, the second point. I don't believe that um, this proposal is contrary to paragraph 6.279 of the SPPS, as I believe this is an appropriate use uh, within the Dolan complex. Uh, the use is already approved on the site and nearby, have established the character of the site and this development uh, is not incompatible. And I also believe that uh, the site not to be uh, part of the countryside. So with that being said, Chair, uh, can I propose that we do not accept the officer's recommendation to refuse uh, the planning permission, please? 
Okay, go ahead, Suzanne. Yeah. Sorry, members, just in terms of clarity, I think it's important to note this site is, is outside the town centre. It is countryside, okay. Um, it's protected route. Just in relation to Councillor Mooney's point about the histories, um, there is, it says there permission granted. Sorry, permission was actually refused for four retail units on this site, okay. Um, so there's no permission here. The existing building on the ground is not an approved retail use where this standalone unit's going, okay. So in terms of the SPPS, it directs us to town centres. We've got the Strabane Town Centre, what we're basically saying is, look, any new retail activity should be located within Strabane Town Centre. Perfect place for an ice cream parlour. Um, so just in terms of clarity, it, it it's not town centre, it, it is countryside, even though it might not look like that on the ground. I appreciate that. But just in terms of facts. Thanks. Thanks, Suzanne. I think some of the, the arguments we were hearing was uh, at and around that matter. Um, and of course, uh, the our outdated um area plan, uh, and inverted commas, uh, not wishing to prejudice anything here, uh, um, members. However, we do have a proposal from Councillor Byron, and clearly that needs a seconder, so is there anyone prepared, Councillor uh, Gallagher? Uh, thank you. Just following on from Councillor Jason Byers, like I am, um, on this previous to the, the previous application, I think uh, we can look to set aside uh, refusal reason one, which is also the FDL one, minimum impact, uh, regarding uh, refusal reason two. Again, like a previous speaker, we could ask to get that set aside. Like from, I know we're talking about town centre development, but there is, Quite a built up frontage from as the roundabout to Lefford Bridge. Uh, and as that officer acknowledged, don't have, if you were talking to anyone passing, they wouldn't, <laughs> there would be a long argument to say they're in the countryside. Uh, and and again, uh, re refusal number three around intensification. And as a, a previously said, I think. There is ebb and flow of intensification around the permitted development, which I this I don't think could uh, be a refusal reason because it would be hard to notice, Chair. I think it, you know, that way that as I said, the ebb and flow. I don't think that we should be given consideration and asked all three to be set aside. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Councillor Gallagher, um, in, in relation to Claudia. Um, I, I've, I've just noticed in the chat box, Councillor Raymond Barr, you've indicated. I'll chair that. That, that was just before uh, Councillor Jason Barr made the proposal. I, it was a question for Suzanne, but she more or less uh, answered it. You know, I was just, I just wanted to follow up on that. But uh, uh, that's okay. Now go ahead with the proposal. Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you, Raymond. Um, my apologies, I, did, I didn't see it in, uh, in the chat box, but we were probably getting indications in the room at the same time as you were typing on. Uh, so, members, we have a proposal from uh, Councillor Jason Barr, um, uh, seconded by uh, Councillor Paul Gallagher, and so uh, we'll take it to the vote, and I'll ask Maura to record that vote. Maura, did you wish to address the committee before we do that? Yeah, but I think Councillor Gallagher um, outlined his reasons. I was just concerned there was only one reason discussed, but I think he covered three other the three other reasons, which I thought was important that we did that in terms before we took a vote. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, hang on. Councillor Mini, just done at the last second. Sorry, just, just one point to pick up. I think when Suzanne replied to my previous thought, I wasn't sort of specifically sort of pointing out certain areas. I think what I was trying to say about there's an establishment because of the history, there's a principle there that these retail units have developed over 30 years. And I don't think that number two is probably a sustainable reason on that basis because of the character now that indicates the area that's there. So, I mean, I think this is this is obviously yum-yums we're talking about, this sort of building, but, you know, what we have here is a built up um, area, you know, with retail units and various descriptions. So I don't think and based on now, because of the our argument based on the Strabane area plan, it's outdated, although it's, ex, it's extant, it is outdated. And probably in my view, you can take it to the, there, there's a sort of, there's probably a, 
we're at a sort of touching post now where you can say that, you know, this area has probably got its own character defined by 30 years of planning history. And I think that's where we are. And I guess that, that was a point I was trying to make. But I think it's a valid reason they point out for refusal number two as well. So, um, obviously, um, nicely, Councillor Gellar's point three, I think, I think both agents have led evidence here today uh, based on the engineering reports and based on the reports that obviously the ebb and flow of intensification, as Councillor Gellar has correctly identified, shows that there is, you know, a rebuttal to DFA on that basis. And uh, I'd be happy to support number three as well. So thank you, Chair. Thanks for that, Councillor Minnie, and, and thanks for clearing that up uh, in relation to your views on it, and I'm sure that Julie noted. Um, uh, Maura, let's, let's take it to the vote. Thank you, Chair. This is um, item six, and this is a proposal not to accept officer's recommendation. Alderman Alan Breslin? Four. Okay. Alderman Keith Kerrigan? Alderman Keith Kerrigan? Alderman Drew Thompson? Four. Okay. Uh, Councillor Jason Barr. Four. Thank you. Councillor Raymond Barr. Four. Thank you. Councillor John Boyle. Four. Thank you. Councillor Angela Dobbins, his apologies. Councillor Paul Gallagher. Four. Thank you. Councillor Christopher Jackson. Four. Thanks. Councillor Dan Kelly, as apologies, and Councillor Patricia Logue, as apologies. Councillor Kieran Maguire, thank you. Councillor Fulton McKinney, as apologies, and Councillor Sean Mooney. Four. Thank you. It's unanimous. Okay, members, thank you very much. Uh, that is a unanimous um, opinion shared by the committee across everybody. Uh, so again, uh, all that remains for me to do um, is to um, thank Brian and, and Connor in, in particular for uh, join us today and also uh, to extend uh, our thanks to uh, Daniel and Michaela as well uh, for coming along and speaking. Um, we just need to bring Suzanne in briefly. I would need A's in the side of my head. So how members. Head. Just to advise, Rhodes are saying that they have not reviewed the drawings at this time because um, of their view on it. So we will review the drawings. We will review the issue with road service. If it requires an amended plan in terms of layout, we'll bring it back. And if not, we'll be able to issue it. Okay. Thanks, Suzanne. Everybody got that? Yeah, understood. Thank you, Suzanne. As I said, um, just extending uh, our thanks to all of those who spoke to us uh, this afternoon in relation to this item and the last one. Um, and I'm sure uh, on behalf of the committee, uh, pass on our, our best wishes to uh, Gabriel Dolan and his family uh, and their uh, cont the continuing success of their businesses. Okay, members, um, we'll move on. Uh, and the next item on our list for decision, we have a number of these uh, hubs, um, Pulse Smart Hub telecommunications kiosks in front of us. We have to take them and we'll take them in the order because, of course, they're all in different locations and, and each location has its own particular uh, challenges, shall we say. So, um, we have, as the first of these, item number seven, which is LA 11 2021 forward slash 1020 forward slash F. Um, and Maliki is going to take us through that. So Maliki, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Chair. Um, good afternoon, members. Um, item seven is LA 11 2021 1020 F as a full plan application. The proposal is for uh, a smart hub telecommunication kiosk with double-sided digital screen. Uh, the location is lands three metres east of uh, Richmond Centre, the, the Diamond, uh, and the recommendation is to refuse. Um, you'll see before you the, the proposed location is outlined in red and the, the small rectangle here. The, the, the site is located to near the steps. Um, you may be aware of Richmond Chambers as part of the, the larger Richmond uh, Centre. There's a set of steps leading up to those offices. Um, the, the site is located um, just uh, just a few metres from the steps and within the, the Diamond area, which is, a, I suppose, is a well-known area of the city centre um, and the historic uh, walled city. 
Um, for information purposes here, we've um, shown you all on, on the screen um, the context of the, the proposed hubs within the, the existing conservation area. Uh, on the, the, the image here showing the red outline is the, the extent of the historic conservation area. Um, you'll, you'll, you'll be aware of the, the wall city, obviously, and the diamond at the center of that. So the, this proposal is located within, uh, right in the middle of our conservation area. Uh, and the other image shows you that um, locations of other hubs that have been under consideration or, or have been decided. Um, the red shows applications which have had recommendations for refusal. Um, the green is applications which have been granted permission. Uh, and the, the black is just our applications pending decision. So in terms of the, the proposal itself, um, as uh, the chair says, we have a number of these going before you. Let know. So I suppose they, they give a description of the first application without rehearsing to, at each one of what these are. Um, the applications are known as uh, smart hub units. Um, they're, uh, they're, they're, a, they're part of a network of uh, proposed hubs um, to be located within the city centre. Um, they have a, a purpose, um, they have a sort of multi-purpose. The, the main purpose, I suppose, um, is advertising. Um, but the, the applicant has also indicated they have all our um, ancillary uses as well, including a defibrillator. Um, also, there's uh, sensors that uh, capture crucial data and can be shared, um, such as uh, for air quality. Um, they can be used uh, as, a, as an override function by the police if there's important public messaging to be put out to the public in the city centre. Um, and also for general public messaging. Um, there's also uh, an I-99 function, and uh, so it's just apologies and report there. That in terms of public message, and it should say Derry City Centre, and not Belfast City Centre. Um, in terms of the, the free, we also have a free to use uh, touchscreen interface where um, locals and I suppose visitors alike can um, access maps and sort of digital functions uh, on a free Wi-Fi. Um, Free or free Wi-Fi um, facility, um, which also you can make local calls and national calls, and I believe you can charge your mobile phone. So th that's generally what they are in terms of their, their structure. Is it a is a it's a standalone structure? Um, they're proposed to be located within footpaths within the city centre. Um, they're 2.5 meters in height. They're one meter in width and 0.38 meters in depth. Uh, and the images there, you can give you an idea of how they look like, uh, uh, both in plan and also uh, you'll see in the there's a photo uh, a photo CGI image of how um, this particular proposal will look like uh, on the streetscape um, located uh, within the diamond area. So in terms of policy consideration, the Dairy Area Plan, SPPS, PPS3, PPS6 uh, are the relevant policy considerations and there's also the historic design guidance within the conservation area is also a material consideration. Um, we've consulted a number of uh, statutory consultees in relation to the applications. Uh, these include DFA roads, who have uh, provided uh, recommended refusal reasons uh, in relation to uh, PPS3 and in particular policy AMP1. Uh, in relation to this particular proposal in the diamond, their main concern uh, relations to, is in relation to the, the positioning of the smart hub and the effect that that would have on uh, the width of a street in terms of movement um, for uh, pedestrians and non-motorized users. Uh, and we've also consulted historic environment the division. Um, given the location of the development within the, the diamond, there are a number of uh, key listed buildings uh, within the locality. So they've commented on the, the, the siting of the proposed smart hubs and their effect on the setting of uh, existing listed buildings uh, within um, the locality. I suppose it's important to say for both consultees, um, whilst they have issues with the applications, also suggested um, alternative locations, um, which I suppose fell outside the red line of these applications and would require new applications uh, if acceptable. 
So they, they, they're satisfied that uh, there are alternative siting locations uh, available in the locality. So in terms of HED, um, HED have uh, recommended refusal on the basis that the proposal, the proposed positioning will have an adverse impact on the setting uh, of a number of listed buildings. Um, you will see the detail of the, the buildings that they've identified within the, the case officer report. Um, officers have considered the response of HED uh, and whilst um, accepting that some of the, the buildings uh, would fall within the setting, we also recognise that some of the buildings by, put forward by HED are perhaps not uh, what we would see to be within the setting or visually linked with the, the, the proposed location of a smart hub. But saying that, um, they particularly have concerns with the, the well-known uh, Austin's building. It's a, it's a high listed, high grade listed building from the diamond and also the the diamond itself in terms of the war memorial um, are within the immediate setting of the of views of the um, of the proposed hub. So and on, on that ground we accept uh, and recommend the the refusal reasons put forward by HED. Um, as I alluded to earlier and shown in the images, the, the site lies uh, within a key um, civic um, space within the conservation area. Um, it's within the walled city. Um, it's within the, the centre of the, the walled city, the diamond, the, the set piece, I suppose, of the, 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 the street layout, of the historic street layout of the, the city. Um, it's surrounded by listed buildings and key uh, elements that I suppose that make the, the historic city conservation area special. So um, we've considered uh, the impact um, of the proposal on its on this prominent location, uh, and believe that the setting, uh, if it if approved at this particular point within the conservation area, uh, and given the scale and form of the, the type of element, will have an adverse impact uh, on the the, the the immediate setting of the diamond, um, part of the conservation, and have an adverse effect and uh, the contrary to BE four. And BH12, B4 of the plan and BH12 of PPS6. <clears throat> We've also um, considered the response from um, DFA roads. As alluded to earlier, their primary concerns with the applications relate to road safety and traffic progression, uh, which they view as including the movement of non motorized users along the adopted footway network uh, and across the, uh, the carriageway. Um, they have provided refusal reasons, uh, particularly in relation to the narrowing of the footway um, at the Diamond, um, which they believe is unacceptable, does not provide a safe and convenient um, moving pattern along this part of the Diamond. Um, <clears throat> whilst it's accepted by officers that the hub will result in narrowing at this particular location, uh, it is not accepted that uh, it will result in an adverse impact on the convenience and movement of pedestrians in the locality. Um, I set out in the report, we Lodi, refer to the um, standards, uh, the RMB standards. They're not set within policy. Um, we consider that the, the proposal, um, when assessed against AMP, one, that sufficient space remains within the immediate locality and the wider street for the free flow of pedestrians at this locality and an accessible environment will be maintained uh, if the, the hub is erected. So we we don't uh, believe that the refusal reason put forward by DFA roads can be sustained uh, in our view at this particular locality. You're aware of a number of uh, lit items. Uh, I think there was a number of images that's been circulated to the members and so uh, we understand that um, the agent is going to refer to him during his presentation. I suppose at this point, if um, we have no comments to make on those at um that are in those, in those images, but if members want the anything clarified uh, um after the the agent's uh, presentation, we'd be happy to to respond. Um we also circulated a late objection, which was just received today online uh through the public planning register um on behalf of the Foil Civic Trust. Uh, I suppose it's raising many of the similar issues in relation to the conservation area, the setting of a conservation area, and the setting of uh, listed buildings, etc., within that locality. So, I suppose we would uh, agree uh, with uh, much of the, the points raised within that objection, and uh, believe that you no know, which should it be should be given to the consideration should be given to the comments made 
and that objection. So in summary, officers have considered all of relevant material considerations, including policy and legislation, consultee responses and relevant case law, including planning appeals and submissions by the applicant. Um, we would recommend refusal on the basis of the adverse impact of the proposed hub on nearby listed buildings and the setting of the area of this part of the conservation area. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Maliki, for uh, presenting the report. Uh, I think you did reference there that the agent um, has submitted some images that members will have seen in their late items. As I understand it, we we can put those up on the screen to assist um, the agent. I think that request to be made, and I was happy enough to do that. And uh, speaking of whom, uh, he joins us now. So can I welcome... Oh. Before I do that, Matt, bear with me. There was one wee thing that I reminded Maura to do, and now I've forgotten that I reminded her to redo that. So Maura, do you want to do that? <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Members, I just wanted to alert you to the fact that when we were doing chairperson's business and late items, um, you'll have picked up that I hadn't listed um, the late item that was received today um, from Mr. Tracy was added to the bottom of your pack. And clearly you've seen that whenever you've gone through your pack earlier, um, because that related to this particular application. And I just wanted to point that out before we proceeded and also just you know, obviously these are fairly minor applications, but in terms of managing, we did attempt to try and negotiate alternative locations for these minor applications, but we're here because obviously the agent had asked us to take the applications into committee. So it's just in terms of management. Thanks, Chair. That's, uh, that's grand. Thank you, Maureen. Thanks for uh, coming back. And with that, uh, 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 members, of course, you have the opportunity to read that, that late item at, at the very top of the program today. So can I again welcome Matt Kennedy here to the planning committee, no stranger to us of course Matt, you're very welcome. Um, uh, Matt, you will be addressing all of uh, the applications that are still in front of us today so we'll take them one at a time as I'm sure you appreciate. So we'll have Malachi and then we'll come to you. It's a bit of, bit of Mal and Matt this afternoon um, from here on in. Uh, okay, so Without further ado, Matt, I'll uh, pass it over to yourself. Okay, Chair, can you hear me? Um, yeah, if I can't, I'll let you know, but currently that sounds okay. Okay. Okay, Chair, thank you, and thank you, councillors on the Planning Committee for allowing me to make representations on these applications. I first made these applications for the Pulse Hubs in September 2021. I've subsequently obtained planning permission for Pulse Hubs at Waterloo Place and adjacent the Millennium Forum, and permission is about the issue for hubs at both Waterloo Street and Foy Street. There's already 27 pulse hubs either built or approved and around Belfast City Centre, within the conservation areas and adjacent to or in close proximity to listed buildings, and the applicant is keen to roll out similar pulse hubs in Derry, Centre, Derry City Centre as well. However, the objections the objections to this proposal are that it would adversely impact on the setting of listed buildings, detract from the historic core, impact the character and appearance of the conservation area, and obstruct important views. I do not believe that these objections are sustainable for the following reasons. First, public benefits. These pulse hubs provide a number of benefits to the general public, namely, one, uh, public access defibrillator, allowing anyone, even without training, to save a life. These defibrillators are easily accessible and walk the user through how to use it. The applicant indicates that this life-saving function was used 12 times in Belfast in 2022. These proposals will provide seven defibrillators within the city centre. City Centre Initiative has also said that they will have a maintenance function, checking these defibrillators and ensuring they're functional and not damaged. Two, sensors that capture crucial data and air quality made available to city stakeholders. Three, a police override function for public messaging on the main screen in case of an emergency. This facility was used to great effect in Belfast when it was used to alert women that a man on a bicycle was attacking women in the city centre in 2022. Uh, public messaging to promote the city, local services and events in conjunction with city centre initiative, management and visit Derry. 
a 999 button that connects directly to the police, fire and medical services in case of an emergency or if someone feels intimidated or vulnerable. A free to use touchscreen interface for visitors and tourists to access local maps, services, facilities and visitors information. Free public Wi-Fi so that people can benefit from the in the city centre. City centre initiatives believe that all of these functions outlined above will be of great assistance to visitors and tourists, particularly during major festivals and events such as Halloween, Clipper, the Jazz Festival, and the City of Swamp with visitors. The, the hubs also allow free local and national calls for users, plus free phone charging and scope for mobile, mobile data offloading. These applications are all supported by Jim Roddy, the City Centre Manager and City Centre Initiative, who sees significant benefit in these proposals. The Pulse Hubs are also supported in Belfast by both the Ambulance Service and the PSNA due to their significant health and public safety benefits. I'd also point out that up until today, and this application has been on since September 2021, no member of the general public or third party has objected to the proposals, and we haven't seen any objection. Uh, two, the historic city conservation area and important views. HED indicates the proposal will harm the character and appearance of the conservation area. However, the both the principle and the design of the proposed pulse hubs has already been found acceptable by the planning department in all our locations in the conservation area and narrower streets with lower buildings, i.e. Waterloo Street. The proposed pulse hubs have also been found acceptable in similar locations and conservation areas in Belfast by both the Planning Department and the Planning Appeals Commission, further illustrating a, a significant inconsistency in decision making. In a 2019 Planning Appeal 2019A047 allowed for a pulse hub in York Street in Belfast, the Commissioner stated, the design is the standard design for the smart hubs provided by this operator. It has been accepted by the Council as an acceptable development in numerous other locations within the Belfast City Centre, including adjacent to listed buildings and within this and other conservation areas. I believe that these hubs are acceptable elsewhere in Belfast conservation areas and also in this conservation area. It should also be acceptable in this location. This pulse hub is set back 19 metres from the War Memorial and it's separated functionally, visually and physically from it by the roadway around the diamond and the public open space that adjoins it. The War Memorial can be appreciated best from the open space immediately around it. This proposal does not obscure or block any important views of the War Memorial from this location just outside the Richmond Centre, adjacent the entrance to the housing executive premises. I'd also point out the diamond has an out outer perimeter of 248 metres and there are panoramic views, panoramic views of the War Memorial from all around the diamond. The pulse hub at 1 to 1.2 metres wide would block or obscure around 0.4% of any view of the War Memorial from the diamond. There, but I, I would clearly say that no important view is obscured. Excuse uh, me, Matt. Sorry, your five minute speaking rights is now complete. Okay. Matt, is there anything you um, want to add to that? Just I'll give you a... I would like. Anyway. I would like, Chair, if I could run through the various images and just make a quick comment on each. Um, if you can make it quick, Matt, just trying I, to manage. I, the, I'm, sure, I'm sure you'll understand. Just trying to manage the meeting as best we can, and, and trying to get yeah. through as many of these along with you as we can as well. Okay. So Matt's asked to put those images up if we can do so. I'm sorry, that's uh, yes. Right, yes. Sorry, Matt, I was just about to say, I, I mean, obviously these images uh, that we're looking at, if you can just as, as quickly as you can. Yes, uh, OK. Um, image one is the one that uh, Maliki had shown uh, previously, but you can see Austin's, Austin's building uh, in the background uh, and you can see the proposed hub on image number one. In terms of image number two, I thought it was important to take that photograph because it actually shows that the hub is almost underneath the Richmond Centre, which is not a thing of beauty in itself. And if you can see the uh, advertising on the ground floor, you can clearly see that the hub is going to be seen against the backdrop of that. Um, 
Austin's building six six stories in sight. Uh, it has a frontage of over 32 metres. Uh, this hub is a metre wide and is two and a half metres high. I don't think it adversely impacts on or it affects uh, Austin's building in any way. Um, if we could move on then to images three and four. What I've done here, Chair, is image three is Castle Place in Belfast. Uh, what I've done is I've indicated in green where the hub was approved at appeal. Uh, I've also indicated in red. If you look at the red, those red arrows indicate listed buildings. Uh, the first listed building indicated is Anderson and Macaulay building. The second one is uh, the Premark building. The third one is Tesco's. Uh, so what you have here is that you have five listed buildings in close proximity to the hub in Belfast uh, at Castle Place, and that was granted planning permission at appeal. I would argue that those are similar circumstances and a similar, a similar uh, situation as what we have here at the Diamond. Um, I've also then got image four, which clearly shows you what we have here is we have a Danska Bank, which is a listed building on your left. I have City Hall, which is a listed building in the foreground. And then I have the proposed George Best Hotel, which is a Scottish mercantile building, which has been acquired by the Martin Group. Uh, and what I've shown is I've shown the actual hub, uh, which you can clearly see there. That has been also approved. Um, and you can see that that's in close proximity to those three listed buildings, which will be three of the premier listed buildings in Belfast. And the Planning Appeals Commission felt fit to approve those two as well. Now, HED make the argument that some of these hubs replaced uh, telephone boxes. Only 10 of these hubs replaced telephone boxes and there are 27 approved. None of the two examples that I give you, sorry, uh, the one in Castle Place didn't replace a telephone box. Um, so really, Chair, um, I, that's all I have. Uh, thank you very much for listening to me. And I would ask, uh, request that the committee would reverse this recommendation, please. Thank you, Matt. Um, I'm glad we did put those up, actually, because it, it helps. Um, uh, so... That's why I don't always stick rigidly to the time frames that we present to people because it's I think it's important that we always try and put these things into context, Matt. Um, uh, um, for anybody else that's watching as well, of course. Um, members, uh, any questions for Matt in relation to this application? No questions uh, for you at this point, Matt. Uh, so I'm sure you'll be staying with us. Members, any questions to the officers in relation to this application um, today? To Maliki or any other officer? Can I ask a question in, in, in relation to this then, um, in the absence of any other questions to, to officers? Can you advise me, because I don't know, um, nobody knows everything, the, do you have to put on a planning application and to put on a telephone kiosk? You do? Is that correct? It's a conservation area. It depends, I think, but I would need to check and come back to you. It's, the reason I'm asking the question and of this particular one is that there's a telephone kiosk very clearly on that photograph. Now, what's the difference in my view, I think? That's the question for the committee to consider. What's the difference in a hub and a telephone kiosk? But anyway, you know, uh, if, you, if you're asking that question in line with this particular application, I think of you as that, um, and it's, I think it came out through the HED um, response, is that HED were quite happy to align you know, the hub position along where the existing telephone box is because it's not on that immediate setting. Um, of the view that we have shown, the image we have shown, because it's set back towards the steps, you know, uh, and sort of set within the existing street furniture, you know. So that's the the, the distinction that HED have made in this 
uh, application. Okay, Maliki. Um, I would argue these things can be a little bit subjective at times, but anyway, uh, members, if there's no further questions, the officers, I've certainly asked one. Um, Paul, you did indicate something, but I'm, I'll. I'll Aye, aye, I was thinking that. Councillor Mooney. Just one for Malagy. Uh, Malagy, um, Matt did reference an appeal from, from that case in Belfast. Did you consider that when you were I mean, you're assessing the application just because obviously he's made reference to it? I'm just wondering if there's any view you might have on it. Thank you. Yeah, look, there's been a, a number of appeals that uh, the agent has um, referred to us and we're aware of a number of a plan appeals in general. Um, uh, in relation to smart hubs in Belfast City Centre, so they they were taken into consideration, uh, and I suppose you'll I suppose you'll see in some of the other applications we're going to discuss, we've given with the some of the findings of the PAC in relation to their um, findings in relation to interpretation of roads policy, etc. Like no, um, but in relation to um, the setting of buildings and setting of conservation areas, I like, know we're very much of the view that it's it's each site uh, within its own context um, that we have, have approved. We have approved um, um, hubs within the conservation area, but um, we, we we have to take uh, into account you know the the particular position on the pathways. The, the suppose the set piece and where they are in location, the particular buildings within the conservation area, uh, and I suppose on and this one the diamond and uh, one of the other applications is the suppose is the prominence or the significance of the the area of the the conservation area. Okay, anybody else any questions? Right. Uh, for. On the back of that. And there would be more significance given you know, the applicant was talking about Belfast versus uh, the inside the walled city. The, the, you know, it's a bit like apples and pears, isn't it? Really, there's there's like a, a massive difference between talking about individual buildings comparing an actual walled city where uh, the differences, I think, might be the only one in Europe. Do you know what I mean? Um, yeah, well, all conservation areas will have their own particular character and their own reason for being designated conservation areas. Likewise, we list the Baldwin, some it's because of their historic importance or uh, there might be some arch architectural merit. Um, architectural reason, I suppose, for listing the Baldwin. So it is, a, it is very important to take each case and its own merits and in its own context. Um, Every conservation area will have its own design guide as well. Um, the, there is a I suppose quite a recent design guide for the historic city conservation area. I think it's 2012. Uh, and I suppose uh, if you, you read through that and look at that, um, the, the diamond and the Shiki Street and the, the area within the walled uh, city uh, is uh, given particular importance, you know, in terms of the, the overall um, character of the, the conservation area. Right, members. Any any other? Uh, Councillor Jackson. Yes, he's. Yep. Yeah, yeah. uh, okay. Go ahead, Councillor. It's, it's not a question. Um, it's not a question. Bear with me, members. I just I've just been made aware actually that we have Dermot Madden, who's who's um, obviously been invited. He's on the meeting um, from HED. If you've got any questions for Dermot, he's there to to answer them. Okay. No questions for Dermot. Um, okay, Councillor Jackson. Um, good morning, good chair. And I suppose I'm going to start by saying that, um, the benefits and you, you can see, and, and they're, they're well outlined in the report. And I'm glad to see Maliki outlined or clarified, um, that it's not an initiative ruled out by Derry, Derry City or Belfast City Centre. And, um, but because because it did jump out at me, um, and or was it Belfast? But in, in this instance, uh, despite the benefits that 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 would clearly come from the smart hub, um, 
there's I would tend to agree with the advice from HCD, particularly like you, you do have the telephone kiosks kiosk located in very close proximity, which could potentially be a much better site. Um, so I, I just can't understand why the applicant went for where he went for. So um, I'm content to propose we accept the officer's recommendation to refuse. Okay, thank you, Councillor Jackson. Members, proposal from Councillor Jackson uh, to accept the officer recommendation to refuse. Uh, is there a seconder for that proposal? Councillor Gallagher, seconded by Councillor Gallagher. So, uh, members, uh, we'll move on. Um, so, proposal from Councillor Jackson, uh, seconded by Councillor Gallagher to um, accept officer recommendation to refuse. Um, I'll pass it over to Maura and we'll take the vote. Thank you, Chair. Uh, members, this is item seven and it's the proposal to accept the officer's recommendation. Um, Alderman Alan Breslin. Alderman Alan Breslin. Um, Alderman Keith Kerrigan. Maura, I must uh, the wee bit at the start. So nope. I would rather not either I can abstain or not abstain. vote whatever you prefer. That's grand. I'll okay. just put abstain. Um, Alderman Drew Thompson. Or Maura. Thank you. Councillor Jason Barr. Thank you. Councillor Raymond Barr. Or Maura. Thanks. Councillor John Boyle. Or. Uh, Councillor Angela Dobbins. Apologies. Uh, Councillor Paul Gallagher. Or. Thank you. Councillor Christopher Jackson. Or. Thank you. Councillor Dan Kelly, apologies. Councillor Patricia Logue, apologies. Councillor Kieran Maguire, thank you. Councillor Philip McKinney, apologies. And Councillor Sean Mooney, thank you. Unanimous, thanks. Okay, um, so members, uh, that's unanimous. Um, uh, so we'll move to the next uh, Smart Hub. Um, and as I said, we're treating them all uh, in their own right. So um, the Next one is item number eight, and it's um, LL eleven twenty twenty one forward slash one zero two three forward slash A. Uh, Maggie, over to you. Yep, thank you, Chair. Item eight, LL eleven twenty twenty one one zero two three A uh, is a an application for advertisement consent for the double-sided digital panels to the Smart Hub. Um, and it's the same location as the previous application, um, just east of the Richmond Centre in the Diamond. And the recommendation is to refuse consent. So again, we're looking at the, the same location. Um, I suppose the, the last application was considering the structure, the host structure. Um, where the various consent is looking at the, the actual digital panels that's, uh, that the structure will uh, contain uh, and uh, require advertisement consent through the, the advertising regulations. Again, um, you're aware of the context from the last application uh, and uh, <coughs> the proposed location of the double sided digital. Um, the advertisement panels is shown here. I suppose it's like a large digital screen uh, on both sides there. Uh, and you can see in the CGI image there, it's, uh, I suppose, animated you know, for the purposes of the, the, the image. Uh, the policy context is different for this application because it's for advertisement consent. So it's a dairy area plan, the SPPS. PPS 17 uh, in relation to the control of outdoor advertisements, uh, PPS 6 uh, in relation to conservation reasons uh, and the historic design guidance uh, and its supplementary guidance. Um, we've consulted um, DFA roads in relation to this application uh, as they have a statutory responsibility to comment on public safety of signs. They have recommended refusal uh, in relation to policy um, 81 of PPS 17 in that it would have permitted prejudice the safety and convenience of road users since the siting of a case leaves insufficient clearance on the footway for non-motorised users. So to go through the, the issues uh, set out in the report in summary, again, uh, similar uh, concerns from officers in relation to the impact of the, the digital nature of the signs uh, and uh, the, the, the signs themselves in terms of the impact on this uh, 
key conservation area and location from the conservation area, this prominent location, and the adverse impacts on the views in and out within this key subic street. Uh, we believe it will be a conflict with policy B4 and BH12 of BPS6. Um, we've also considered in the report um, the refusal reasons put forward by DFA Roads. Um, DFA Roads, as I say, have an issue about narrowing the footway uh, and the impact that the, the advertisement will have uh, on the convenient movement of uh, users of the footway. Um, I suppose different from the full applications relating to the advertising applications, PPS 17 does have a public safety uh, aspect. It's just not about movement. So um, as a statutory authority, DFA roads have to comment on whether signs will have an um, impact on public safety. So within paragraph 411 of AD1, uh, it, it sets out the main types of advertisements which are likely to pose a threat to public safety. Um, as I say, they're detailed in the report the, 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 the number of scenarios that, um, that will have a, 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 an adverse impact. We've considered the reason put forward by DFA roads, but we do not agree that the issues raised are consistent with any of the types outlined in AD1 and paragraph 4, uh, 11 of AD1, therefore couldn't be sustained in our view under policy AD1 of PPS 17 for, um, for the reasons set out in the report. Again, um, you're aware of the lit images uh, and the um, these have been covered by the agent uh, and has uh, has speaking rights. Um, so uh, the, the recommendation relating to this application uh, is they refuse consent on the basis of the adverse impact it would have on uh, the, conserv the setting of the conservation area as set out in the, the officer's report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Maliki. Um... And again, uh, uh, we have uh, only the one speaker, Matt Kennedy. So again, Matt, uh, I'll pass back to you now to address the committee in relation to this particular application. So again, go ahead, Matt. Okay, Chair, Chair can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Um, um, Chair, uh, the committee has made the decision on the planning application. Um, the advert consent can't operate without the without the planning permission. So uh, realistically, I accept the decision of the committee in relation to the planning application. Um, and therefore, the advert the advert application has to fall as well. Um, so therefore, I don't think there's any there's any need to run through five minutes just putting forward the merit of the advert proposal because they're simply exactly the same as the planning application proposal. And you know, there's no point in me wasting the committee's time. Uh, the committee's spoken on this application, and there's no point in me adding it because you know the decision's been made. I accept the decision. Thank, thank you, Matt, and I, I appreciate uh, what you're saying, and I appreciate uh, your cooperation in relation to this. I mean, it's, it's logical enough. If you haven't got the, <laughs> if you haven't got the hobby, you haven't got the adverts. So <laughs> we've lost the chicken. Where's the egg? Um, so. Uh, members, you know the formalities are the formalities. Um, uh, so, uh, if anybody has any questions for the officers, uh, of course, open it up to the floor now to put them to. You. I, I don't think you've got any questions for Matt. Do you? Is, is anybody no questions for Matt? No. So, um, Councillor Jackson. Well, the only question I had was the validity of of the application, but um, on on listening to Matt, I'm content to. Oh, so we accept the recommendation if that's what's needed. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Jackson. So, um, uh, Councillor Jackson is uh, proposing that we accept the recommendation for this one uh, uh, to refuse. Uh, we need a seconder, Councillor Mooney. Okay. Uh, members will put it to the vote. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, this is item eight: proposal to accept officer's recommendation. Alderman Alan Breslin. Alderman Keith Kerrigan. Bar Mara. Thanks. Alderman Drew Thompson. Bar Mara. Thanks. Al uh, Councillor Jason Barr. It's just gone. Uh, Councillor Raymond Barr. Bar Mara. Thank you. Uh, Councillor John Boyle. Thanks. Apologies from Councillor Dobbins. Councillor Paul Gallagher. Bar. Thank you. Councillor Christopher Jackson. Bar. Thanks. Apologies from Councillor Kelly. Apologies from Councillor Logue. Kieran McGuire. Thanks. Uh, apologies from Councillor McKinney and Sean Minnie. Thank you. 
Unanimous, thanks. Okay, uh, that's unanimous. I know members at all seen about academic, but we have to go through that that formality uh, because it's in front of us here today. Um, members, it's just gone six o'clock. Uh, we have a number of these that we have to work through. Uh, I'm suggesting that we put a pause on the meeting at this point, um, give everybody a breather and come back and hear the rest uh, tomorrow, which would be numbers um, uh, 11, 12, 13, 14, and then number two. So um, we, we've still got a few to do tomorrow. So uh, can I just, Matt, for now, thank you for uh, coming along. Uh, and uh, we will be back in the same place uh, at 2 p.m. tomorrow, and we'll be starting back with uh, the other hubs that we have uh, to consider. Um, uh, members, can I impress upon members? Of course, you'll all understand it's only the importance of uh, as many attending as possible. And I appreciate that we had a few apologies here today. Hopefully, some of those who had apologies today can return tomorrow. But um, with that, uh, we will put a pause um, and we'll come back to Derry Road and Strabane Chair, 2 p.m. tomorrow. Chair, can I just put in an apology for tomorrow, uh, Alderman Thompson? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I've been somebody saying to me I shouldn't accept your apology here, uh, Alderman Thompson, but uh, of course I'm happy to accept your apology for tomorrow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> They're only joking through, don't panic. Well, uh, right. <laughs> I'm out of the city chair. <laughs> That's a problem. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. We'll call it a day for now, uh, folks, and we'll come back 3 p.m. tomorrow. Thank you and thanks, Drew. Okay. Um, enjoy the rest of your evening, folks, and Matt, we'll see you tomorrow.